bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. How you doing, everybody? It's Monday. Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. That's right. Monday, November 23rd. 327 days into the new year. Just 38 days left. I'd like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet, I'm your so humble host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? Excited. Thanksgiving week. A week to be thankful family, friends, and this great country of ours. And tonight, we have very special guests back with us, Costa McCreas. And for the first time on Fade to Black, Hollis Polk will be with us. We're talking about E.T. Let's Talk, some contact, some entertainment tonight, some great stories from them, and I cannot wait. I've got a little prequel right here in front of me, so I know what's coming. It's going to be awesome. Tomorrow night, right here, John Anthony West. He just got back from Egypt. Just got back. I mean, like, the plane just landed kind of thing. So he will be here with us tomorrow night. There is lots to talk about Uh with news out of Egypt and Giza and the Plateau, Valley of the Kings, and, of course, the Great Pyramid itself. And uh, so tomorrow night, right here, John Anthony West. And then Wednesday night, uh, continuing the tradition, last year we had Linda Moulton Howe on with us. This year we, we shall do the same. So Wednesday night, Linda Moulton Howe is going to be here. And we are going to talk about everything but ISIS, I promise you. That is the arrangement. No, but we're going to talk about uh, Gobekli Tepe and a little Egypt, too, as well. She's uh, actually got a couple of stories up now, um, some reports at Earth Files. Uh, great reading. It's right there on the homepage, so you can just go and click it. And uh, there you go. Um, so we'll be discussing all of that and have some fun on Wednesday night. Uh, Friday night, Thursday, we're going to be off. We're going to do a replay uh, Thursday night. And I want everybody to be happy with your friends and family and eat some good food and and just be thankful for everything that we have. And that'll be when, or Thursday. Friday, I'll be over at Coast to Coast. And my guest will be Alfred Weber. And we'll be discussing his book, The Omniverse. Uh Trans-dimensional intelligence, time travel, the afterlife, and, of course, the secret colony on Mars. And then Saturday, uh, Coast hasn't uh, posted this yet, but I'll just give you the sneak preview. We're going to have Danny Sheehan back, and he's going to be on Coast. And when Danny was with us last week and we were talking about ISIS last Friday when Costas was uh, Costa was here with us, um, I thought that the timing couldn't be better for that refresh in history. So we're going to do that next Saturday on Coast to Coast. And he's going to be my only guest that, that night. And so he's going to do the full show and take calls. 
So very, very busy week in front of uh, Rita and I. And again, we are looking forward to uh, uh, Thursday. You know, uh, Thanksgiving is one of my favorite times of the year to just get together with everybody and and look at the table and look at around, you know, look around at, at the family and just sit here and just think to yourself, it doesn't get better than this, you know, getting together. And uh, there you go. Now, now uh, I want to. Uh, oh, okay. Let me let me get some things in order here, really quick. I would like to welcome our newest sponsor to the show. Get the T. It's getthetea dot com. And at the bottom of the hour, we're going to have Ronnie McMullen from Get the T here for a few minutes to introduce you to the product line. And if you want to go and check it out now, you can just right there at jimmychurchradio.com. You can see the green banners for Get the Tea. And uh, go and click and look at the product line. And then Ronnie is going to be on with us right before Costa and Hollis are with us to uh, go through the product line and say hello to all of the fader knots. And that being said, Studio Dome, we didn't finish our little holiday package over the weekend. <laughs> so we will... We will should should have that ready for you tomorrow. I know I talked about it on Friday night show. And now with that, I wanted to share a little funny story with you. And uh, Rita's going to be so mad. So we had to go. Okay, so Sunday, yesterday morning, she says to me, uh, 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 you know, you stay home and work. I'm going to go shopping with our daughter. And I was like. Okay, all right. I, I, I see how that works. Okay, you get to go have fun, and I have to stay home and work. Okay, fine. And then she says to me, I'm taking your keys. I'm like, well, why would you take my keys? I've lost my keys, she says. Really? Off she goes. All right, she's gone for the rest of the afternoon. She comes back and and we had to go, uh, you know, shopping for you know Thanksgiving for the for the feast on on Thursday, and I said we got to go today. It's Sunday. We got to go. And the world will be out of turkeys if we don't go shopping today. Nah, no problem, no problem. So she comes back and we get in the car, and uh, with with my keys, and she goes, you know, I've I, I don't know where my keys are. I've looked everywhere for them. And I turned turned to her and I said, "Hey, but you got that new key finding device on your keychain, and it's it's one of it's a it's you know it's a locator, it's a GPS on her keychain, and you call it up on your cell phone, and it will a activate the key, so it goes beep beep beep, right? One, two, it'll show you if you left it at work or the office or whatever, it'll pull it up on Google Maps and tell you where your keys are at. It's pretty cool, right?" And she goes. So she's looking for her keys all day and forgot that she had this device on her keychain. So we're driving in the car. And she's like, oh, that's right. Ha, ha, ha. All right. So she goes and, and pulls it up on her phone. And it says the keys are at the house, you know. Okay. So we drive. We come back uh, after shopping. And, and we get home. And she goes to look for her keys. They were where she was standing at that moment. <laughs> the keys were on the, on the dining room table. She didn't even have to use her special device. <laughs> they were there the whole time. So anyway, so then she activates it. And, uh, and you know, she's got herself. She has the keys. And then, boom, click. Keys did it. Beep, 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 beep. Loud, too. Would have found them right away. And that's my funny story. You go and you get one of those devices. You put it on your keys. You lose your keys. And you don't even use it. <laughs> and then you find the keys without the device. You got to love life, right? You got to love your family. And that's why I am thankful for everything <laughs> that I have. Uh, look at Bob. He's already tweeted out. Follow, follow us on Twitter. At J Church Radio. He's just tweeted out, get the tea. That's very cool. Thank you, Bob. Wow. Um, where are we? Where are we? Q&A week is next week. Um, don't forget about that. Alien Snowfest also, February 5th through the 7th. And Big Bear, don't forget about that. Everything is over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
With that, let's get this show cracking. Because today, founder of Papa John's Pizza, John Schnatter, is 54 years old. And before you say, Jimmy, what, why would you do that? Because I saw, you know, I saw that today. I went and looked at his wealth, did a couple of things. Because I have never, to my memory, I've never had a Papa John's pizza. I'll defer that to Rita. Uh, Rita, have we ever had a Papa John's pizza? Because I'm not, I don't remember ever having a Papa John's pizza. I must be the last guy in the country because I, I don't know. But I can't remember ever having a Papa John's pizza. I'm not asking for one to be sent to the studio right now. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I'm the last guy in America. Our dead guy's birthday today is Boris Karloff, 1887 to 1969, died at the age of 81, played played Frankenstein in the famous 1931 film Frankenstein. He also starred in the sequels, Bride of Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein, House of Frankenstein. But my favorite, no, wait, I'm not going to say my favorite. Boris Karloff lived out his final years in England at his cottage, and it was called Roundabout, in the Hampshire village of Bramshot. After a long battle with arthritis and emphysema, he contracted pneumonia, passed away peacefully on February 2nd, 1969, at the tender young age of 81 years old, which takes me to Twitter right now, and we'll get out of here. What's your favorite Karloff film? Because I have one. And in Chicago, everybody that's listening to me right now, they know what I'm talking about. In Chicago, Friday nights, Creature Features. Ooh, that was the show. And like once a year, once a year, they would show my favorite Boris Karloff film. And it scared the crap out of me. So what is your favorite Boris Karloff film? With that, let's get out of here. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be back right after this short break with all of the news that you know nothing about. This is Fade to Black. Tonight, tonight, right here, Costa McCreas and Hollis Polk will be with us. It's going to be an E.T. Let's Talk kind of evening. Tomorrow night, John Anthony West. Wednesday night, our special Thanksgiving Eve broadcast with Linda Moulton Howe. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the Masses on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. I'll be right back. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously. Give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S.com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. 
Hi, this is Chase Klutzke with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station, where the Fader Knots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. Welcome back. This is Fade to Black, the Monday edition. Kicking off our Thanksgiving week right here. Tonight, we have Costa McCreas and Hollis Polk with us. Tomorrow night, John Anthony West. Wednesday, Thanksgiving Eve, Linda Moulton Howe. I'm just looking over, and it's it's kind of funny how the Grinch stole Christmas came in for Boris Karloff. But we do have a winner. Bev Knoll. Coming in strong. That's mine. The mummy. That just scared the crap out of me because you had the whole Egypt thing. And the fact that, you know, the mummy, you know, walked at a quarter mile an hour and you could have outrun him all the way across the country at the age of five. Didn't matter to me. The mummy scared me. The mummy. <laughs> the mummy. When he sat with the hand drops and the, the wrappings and he's just like, no. I watched that movie a hundred times and that scene still gets me. To this day, The Mummy. Man, that was a good movie. On this day in history, blues legend Robert Johnson makes his first ever recording in a makeshift studio set up in adjoining rooms at the Gunter Hotel in downtown San Antonio, Tejas. In his short but hugely, hugely influential life, Johnson spent only five days in that studio at the Gunter Hotel recording Only 41 takes of 29 different songs. Check that, all of you studio musicians out there. He cut 29 songs, 41 takes, and one song, the missing 30th song. And uh, the legend goes, he made a deal with the devil at the crossroads. Because 10 minutes later, 10, 10 months later, he would be dead. Johnson was killed by poisoning at the hands of a jealous husband on August 16th, 1938. On this day in history, Robert Johnson. Uh, Fader fact. More than 2,500 left-handed people are killed every year from equipment used and made for right-handed people. (laughs) That's a fader fact. I was... um, over the weekend, I was I I just did a little a little research. I didn't I didn't post uh, any of it, but I started looking at what are the odds of being killed by a terrorist, you know? And I started looking you know, and I looked into the numbers. And did you know that you would be more likely to be killed by a toddler <laughs> than a terrorist? So I guess we should close the borders down for toddlers. <laughs> I have more too. You would be more like more likely killed by XXX than a terrorist. And it's it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Like you'd be more likely killed by a flying head of lettuce. <laughs> I mean, it's insane. Anyway. It's enough of the fear of that stuff, the fear porn that everybody's doing. All of the news that you know nothing about. The ISIS militant group is reportedly fortifying its Syrian stronghold of Raqqa ahead of the expected bombardment that's supposed to be coming from the international community in the wake of the Paris attacks. While other news outlets are reporting, and the the multiple sources on this, are reporting that the ISIS leadership is actually fleeing Raqqa right now. They've packed up and split. There are residents inside of the city that are saying they just left. They're gone. 
Kurdish and other rebel forces backed by the U.S.-led anti-ISIS coalition right now have gathered just 20 miles to the north and are starting to surround the city. The clock is ticking. And in the bright news of the weekend, now check this out, everybody. This is great. Anonymous hacktivists are using, oh, man, just such a great thing. They're using Rick Rolling. Remember that? You remember the Rick Rolling meme? Remember that? Where uh, a person pretends to hyperlink to one site, but instead links you to the video for Rick Astley's <laughs> I'm Never Gonna Give You Up. You remember that video? You remember Rick Rolling? It's great. Well, Anonymous has decided that they're going to take all of the trending hashtag topics and social media that ISIS is putting out there, and they are going to tag Rick Astley's video to it. <laughs> Anonymous tweeted over the weekend, and I'm quoting here right from their tweet. Our upcoming action, spamming verified ISIS hashtags with Rick Rolls, end quote. And that is from Op Paris Official. There you go. I can't wait. I, I, I haven't had a, a pro-ISIS hashtag pop up in my timeline anywhere. But I'm telling you right now, I will, I, I will click on it for some Rick Astley. I actually went back and watched that video over the weekend. I hadn't seen it in a long time. Rita said it was his trench coat. Military jets from Francis Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier on Monday flew its first missions over the Islamic State-controlled territories in Syria and Iraq and carried out their first airstrikes. The jets have hit two Isla Islamic State targets in Iraq, the French military has announced on Twitter. Now, the presence of, of 26 military aircraft aboard the Charles de Gaulle triples French forces in the region adding to the 12 planes already stationed in the United Arab Emirates and Jordan 6, uh, Rafale and 6, Mirage 2000 aircraft. Russian airstrikes destroy. Now, check this. Now, I, over the weekend, no, 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 let me back up. Over the last week, I, I've gone and watched a bunch of these videos put out by the Russians. And it's extraordinary. And it was a question that I've had all along. Why aren't we doing this? Well, now we are. Russian airstrikes destroy 472 terrorist targets in Syria in the last 48 hours. 1,000 oil tankers in five days. Russian airstrikes have torched more than 1,000 tankers, taken stolen crude oil to Islamic State refineries. Now, uh, the, the videos that I have seen, and some more American airstrikes too, were fleets. When I say fleets, I'm talking about like to the horizon, tanker trucks lined up bumper to bumper in rows, you know, and they, they were saying in, in a couple of shots that I saw that they, they, you know, they destroyed a 500 and I, they were there, there was thousands. I mean, they were just all over the place, but why, why hasn't this been done in the past? If that's where they're making all of their money. Then, today, I watched oil refinery after oil refinery. I'm talking huge tanks of everyone. Pew, 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 pew. Poof, poof, poof. Oil refineries leveled. It's insane. All Russian aircraft have successfully returned to their air bases. And that's according to a Russian spokesman for the defense ministry, as he announced today in his daily briefing. That's enough. I, this will probably be my last ISIS day forever. I, I'm, I'm so done with it. But this is all just good news. Well, unless it involves anonymous. $15 million in apologies from the mayor and police chief. That's right. That's what an attorney says the family of Ahmed Mohammed is demanding from the city and school officials in Irving, Texas, or they're going to file a lawsuit. As you remember, back in September, 14-year-old Ahmed built a clock, got arrested, <laughs> went to jail. <laughs> One of his teachers thought it was a bomb. 
notified school authorities, who then called the police. He was detained, questioned, and hauled off in handcuffs. At the time, the school said it reacted with caution because of the, the contraption had wires hanging out of it, and it looked like an ex- explosive device. Now, I'm just going to say this. It sucked. Ahmed shouldn't have been arrested. Shouldn't shouldn't have happened. The whole thing was an embarrassment. But fifteen million dollars worth of embarrassment and civil rights. He got a college. Uh, he 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 he's set for life. He's going to be going to MIT or Caltech. And th- th- I, I I'm I'm shocked. I'm shocked. As as bad as I feel for that kid, nothing happened. Police. And it's not $15 million worth of uh, cash and apologies from the mayor and the police chief. They should apologize if they haven't already. They should apologize. But $15 million. Where does that number come from? Because I got to tell you, when I was a kid, when I was 14, 13, 12, I was handcuffed all the time. <laughs> I never got paid. Uh, the crash in oil prices. Yeah, send all of your email to Rita at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't, don't uh, harass me for that. And that $15 million, come on. Man, really? Jeez, man. All right. The crash in oil prices is fanning the flames of revolt. In the, inside the walls of OPEC, the war of words has broken out between OPEC kingpin Saudi Arabia and all of the smaller oil producers like Venezuela and Algeria. Venezuela is broke and getting broker. So is Algeria. The smaller countries want the cartel to hit the brakes on production. They want to pump the brakes. They're, they're done. They need to lift the depressed oil prices right now because their economies are struggling. And as the leading oil producer, the Saudis, they they hold all the power. They hold all the cards in that cartel. Their long-term bet is that by keeping oil prices low, they will squeeze the American shale oil producers out of the oil production business. That way, the Saudis can regain the market share that they've lost to the U.S. And I can tell you right now, it ain't going to work. It just ain't going to work. Just just keep doing what you're doing, Saudi Arabia, because I want to get to some 50 cent a gallon gas here. Just 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 keep doing your thing. I feel I feel bad for Venezuela. I do. Algeria, their economies and everything else. But uh, I drive a V8. This is fade to black. Now, what I want to do is I want to bring in. Ronnie McMullen. Ronnie, uh, as everybody knows, uh, Rita and I went on a cleanse last week. And we started it. What day did we start it on? We started the cleanse. Oh, uh, was it was it Monday? Did we do it? It was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Today's Monday. We ended. Okay. So it ended on Friday. So I think we started it on Monday, but I would like to introduce to all of you Fader Knots, Ronnie McMullen from Get the Tea. Ronnie, are you with us? I am. How are you doing, Jimmy? I am doing fantastic, sir. Welcome to the Fade to Black family. And once you are in the car, you jump in the back seat and you shut the door, uh, just get ready for the ride. And it's a, it's a great family here. And... And we welcome you with open arms. So, uh, welcome to the family. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Now, uh, what I would like to do, Ronnie, as I introduce you to the world, um, is we start... Okay, I didn't tell everybody last week what we were doing. But I, before, uh, you know, I throw my enormous weight, which is about 200 pounds, (laughs) behind a company... (laughs) Uh, you know, I, I, I want to go and I want to try it out. I want to make sure that everybody has the same positive experience that I've had from it and, and so forth. So we did that last week as a test uh, through your guidance, by the way. And if I hadn't had your guidance, I don't know what would have happened. But uh, so I think it would. Uh, Ronnie, you tell me, was it last Monday we started? Was that it? I'm, yeah, I believe it was last Monday. Yeah, I think it was last Monday. Now. 
um, it was it was an interesting week, and it was a great week. And the first twenty four hours, I was warned, as the fader knots warned me too. Uh, you know, but it turned out. I want I want your take on this. That it it was a tasty experience. The tea itself, it, whatever it's it, you know what it does to your body. It, it, it's a delicious, refreshing tea. And I want your response to that. Was that an accident or had you planned on uh, that, it, that it would taste that good? Because it just tastes like any other sweet tea, even though there's no sugar in it. It tastes like any other sweet tea that you would drink anywhere in the South. Yeah, it's it's uh, and yes, it is planned that way. Uh, with the marshmallow root in it, it gives it kind of a, a tangy, sweet taste. And you know, so many of these products that you you get that are going to be health products, they they taste like you know river water or something. You know, you're like, <laughs> oh my god, you know, do I have to drink this? Right. It's, you know, so it we wanted it to be nice. And uh, now I want you to I want you to tell us uh, uh, who. Uh, who get the tea is, and, and let's start there. But uh, there was one other little side effect that we got from the tea that was amazing, which is, and it was like almost instant because we would chug it, right? Not sip it, just uh, 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 right and do it and in eight ounce uh, glasses. And it, it changed our mood. And I got to say, Rita was just it, just in a happy, giddy mood after she drank it. It was like I didn't recognize her. I was like, man, you know, wow. and, and it would do the same thing to me, too, as well. What's going on with that? What's with this positive mood swing? Is it because your well, brain it, knows it's getting this crazy nutrition? It, it, you, it, you get energy from it. Um, it's, it's not like a, there's no caffeine in this tea, so there's, it's not like you're going to get this big high or anything. But you just feel better. Your body responds to... It's kind of like if you do supplements, your body responds to it and says, oh, you're feeding me something good. If you go have a salad, oh, you're feeding me something good. You know, you have a big grease burger, oh, what are you doing to me? You know, uh, you know that kind of thing. So it, it responds to you when you give it, when you give your body, it, 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 you know, the intelligence is there. So it definitely responds. Yeah, I could, I could, I could just sense it. It was just something that was uh, really fun to do and experience. And now we're starting our next round. Okay. So we've gone through the first round and uh, we're, yeah, yeah, we're starting, <laughs> we're starting our second round and I, I just, I just feel better. I just feel better. Physically better, uh, my entire, you know, from from my neck down, my digestive setup is is back on track, and it's a uh, pretty impressive. I've got to say, my friend, I'm pretty pretty darned impressed. Now, what? Well, that, that that's what usually people do. They say, you know, I can't believe this works, and it's like, well, it's got to work. Of course, it's supposed to work. You know, well, a lot of products we get don't work. This does, and it does so many great things. If if you have listeners out there that maybe have some extra pounds on them. 10 to 1 says some of that, that poundage is sitting in their colon. And this will do be a gentle cleanse for their colon. And, and I say gentle, and if it's too harsh, you just back off. That's what's great about it. It just gets you that much more time. But it will just gently, and people will find out, they'll go, hey, I lost some weight. And that is where people go. That They get excited. A lot of people try to buy this for a weight loss program, and that's not what it's about. But if you are 50 pounds overweight and you don't eat real good, you're going to lose weight by drinking this tea. What's the philosophy behind Get the Tea? Uh, the philosophy is health. Um, you know, and, and, and I'll, just, I'll just speak for myself. Um, when I got turned onto this tea and put this all together, I lost in a matter of about 60 days, I lost 25 pounds. That's a lot of weight, and for those out there that are over 25 pounds or 50 pounds overweight, 25 pounds is a lot of weight. So when all of a sudden you lose 25 pounds, you get in, you you have this new energy, and all of a sudden you want to do exercise, you want to eat right, you want to do things that help. So then you all of a sudden now you might lose another 10 pounds because you're doing all the right things. And for some people, I mean, we've we've had phone calls with tears saying, you know, I mean, we've had people lose 50 pounds, 60 pounds. 
and we've had people get healthier, their hair grows better, or, or it doesn't hurt their teeth. And I, I mean, it, it is so all over the road because every body is different. I, I noticed uh, a couple of things as I started uh, the program, uh, especially the first two days, the first two days, that all I thought of uh, my normal regimen all day long is to sit in the office, work all day, and think about food. That's what I did, you know, uh, you know, and and I didn't do that. I I I wasn't really a loss of appetite, but for some reason I wasn't constantly thinking. Okay, what am I going to do for lunch? What am I going to do for dinner? I need to eat before the show, you know. And right. it, this constant need to eat, and and that went completely away. What is going on there? Is, is that my imagination? You know, some of this, believe it or not, is is mental and meaning not in a bad way but in, when we start giving our bodies good things uh, we start telling our body I and mean, we can you know, the mind controls so much of, of the body so when we're just going hey i'm drinking the right thing next thing you know you don't get those hunger pains and and when your body is responding to good things that are being put in it um lots of things change lots of things change and this is why i say what you know we've had so many reports and, and testimonies of, of what this does for people that, you know, somebody will say, oh, I grew longer hair and stronger hair, more hair, you know, and I, I lost weight and, you know, I had a liver problem and I had muscle problems and, I mean, it's all over the road and I just think to myself, this tea couldn't possibly do that much. But when you're dealing with the colon and you're dealing with nerves and you're dealing with the muscles and all of this that's going on in the digestive system, the GI tract, um, it, it's amazing how many things that the tea touch because, and this is really a big, big issue, this tea is liquid. It's not a pill. So when you drink it, it goes into the bloodstream immediately. So you're being affected. Now, I, uh, Rita and I did the super tea, and it, uh, I want to talk about those ingredients, and I don't want to run out of time, so I want to get as much in as we can in the next three or four minutes. Uh, what's in the super tea? Persimmon leaves, mava leaves, milk thistle, marshmallow leaves, blessed thistle, papaya enzymes, ginger roots, sarsaparilla leaves, and green tea. So it's when when we talk about tea, it's not like what you buy over the counter at a grocery store. Uh, you got to get that right out of your mind. This is like an herbal tea. So imagine going up on a mountain and drinking some kind of uh, you know something that some Indians made up or you know something that uh, somebody put together. That's kind of the idea. It's all herbs. And that's why it goes to town on your body. Now, what's the difference between the Super Tea and the Life Change Power Cleanse? Uh, the Power Cleanse is just that. It's rock and roll, baby, power cleansing. It's like, uh, it's, it's a lot stronger than the Super Tea. So if somebody's brand new to, this, to the tea, I tell them if you have stomach problems or you're elderly, you'd want the regular tea. If you're, if you're just a regular Joe and, you know, a regular person doing your job and, you know, maybe you sit down a lot, that kind of thing, you're going to want the super tea. And if you've got some major problems that you really need to cleanse your body, then I would drink the super tea and then go to the power cleanse. So power cleanse is only like once or twice a year. I'm, I'm, it, it tackles... <clears throat> I'm reading here on your website, it says, I saw this earlier this week, it tackles the toughest hard drugs, cocaine, yeah. meth, nicotine, alcohol, prescribed drugs, as well as over-the-counter chemicals and other addictive products. That's a bold statement. And so what do you mean by uh, making well, a statement Well, let's put it like this that? way. I, I don't like to go here, but let's put it this way. If you have some kind of drug in you, this stuff will clean you out. Um, we, we tell people that take prescription drugs, drink the tea two hours before or after you're taking your, your prescription drugs. So that kind of gives you an idea for us to say that it will take out. But what's interesting is when you drink the tea, let's say you take a vitamin C, it won't take that out. So it's almost like the herbs know exactly what garbage to take out and what stuff to leave behind. And what about the fat burners that you offer? Uh, the fat burners are uh, great, but they, I'll be real straight up, uh, fat burners work in unison with the tea, but if you're just going to take the fat burners all by yourself to burn fat and think you're going to get thin, probably not going to be the greatest product for you. So you have to do it in conjunction with the uh, tea or the In super conjunction tea. with the tea, and, yes. And really quick before uh, uh, everything else, uh, and your blood purifiers. Oh, uh, those are those. That's really an awesome product because blood's a big, big deal right now. 
um, and does it does exactly what it says. It's it's a natural ingredient to clear to clear up the blood, to help your blood. Um, everything is the help word. It will help you. There's <clears throat> there's no miracle cure out there, but when you put a bunch of helps together, you find things happen. And you have put together, uh, and thank you for coming on tonight. And I, and I want to, uh, what I do want to do is uh, bring you on the show to talk about other stuff besides get the tea, because you've got a brain on you, and I like your take on a lot of different subjects. And uh, I do want to do that. So the invitation is open. You've got a special for the Fader Knots uh, tonight, and what is that? Uh, we're going to free shipping for for all the uh, the Jimmy listeners out there. Uh, free shipping tonight. Um, period. Just just mention Jimmy Church, and you're going to get free shipping. Um, and it's it's. Uh, let me tell you something. If you're wanting something that's going to make a difference, this is going to make a difference because it goes right into your bloodstream. It cleans your colon real mellow, and you're going to love it. And it's it's easy website, getthetea.com. It's too easy. Get the tea. Just It's, it's like giving yourself a command. i got to get the tea. Get yeah. the tea. <laughs> and we have uh, all of all of the banners uh, for Get the Tea are up at jimmychurchradio.com. Go and click on it. You can call. You can order online. Uh, uh, where the PayPal comments are, you can just pop in Jimmy Church right there. Get yourself some free shipping. Get healthy. Rita and I did the super tea. We did the super tea. We went in our hardcore, and we did it all week. <laughs> and and I'll say this real quick: out of all of the surprises, and I, everything was good. It was the taste. I'm blown. I, I I I will not forget that. It was just one of those things where it was just an amazing tasting tea. And what it does for you on the outside is great, or on the inside, beyond the taste. And that was uh, just awesome. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, Jimmy. And uh, we'll we'll get you on next week, and we'll talk some UFOs. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> bye, bye, Ronnie. Take care. Have a good night. GetTheTea.com. Thank you, Ronnie. It is an amazing product. And look, everybody, I didn't say get the tea last week. I said... We were going to do this thing, and we did it, and we wanted to, before we said anything to anybody, we wanted to use the product, and we did. And I got to tell you, it is amazing. So there you go. GetTheTea.com. The links are right there at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'm going to get out of here because when I come back, Costa McCreas and Hollis Polk are going to be right here on Fade to Black. Tomorrow night, John Anthony West, Third or Wednesday. Man, it's a three-day week. I'm all messed up. Wednesday, Linda Moulton Howe. GetTheTea.com. I'll be back right after this. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Katie and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. People love to shop. What if you could shop and it was actually good for you? What if you could actually purchase items that bettered your life? What goes into your body is important to what quality of life you have. How about shopping for items that better your health? GetTheTea.com is that shopping place. We're not only tea, even though that's our number one seller. We are about helping your health. There's Colostrum LD for those of you with autoimmune troubles. The product helps your stomach get on track. GI problems produce pain. Get relief with Colostrum. From LD. How about some fat burners or maybe some joint aid or a power cleanse? There's so much to tell you with very little time. So get help health wise at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Or you can call our friendly operators at 928 308 0408. That's 928 308 0408. Get help and relief by going shopping. Shop at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. Serving people with great products for over eight years. Getthetea.com. 
Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. All right, you fader not. Studio Dome has done it once again. A new Studio Dome fader not special. Introducing the Studio Dome Boom Box Bluetooth speaker. It's got a rear-firing base film subwoofer and dual 52-millimeter main speakers. You'll never listen to your tablet or cell phone speakers again. Just click on the Studio Dome banner, use the promo code JIMMY, and you'll get the SBB for 49 bucks and free shipping. And get a Buddy 4-port USB charger for free. That's a $19.99 value right there. And they'll throw in a Buddy in the box. It's the best deal on the net anywhere just go to jimmychurchradio.com click on the studio dome banner enter the promo code jimmy go back lee Tappy. this is micah hanks of the graylian report and you're listening to jimmy church on fade to black across the globe on the game changer radio network and the one and only kgra radio the planet <laughs> Welcome back to Fade to Black. Tonight, we have very special guests, Costa McCreas and Hollis Polk. Tomorrow night, John Anthony West right here. He's fresh off the plane from Egypt. Wednesday night, a very special Thanksgiving Eve broadcast once again with Linda Moulton Howe. Hollis Polk. Hollis is a clairvoyant and personal coach who teaches the ET Let's Talk community to develop their psychic abilities in order to communicate with extraterrestrial intelligence. Hollis has a bachelor's degree in engineering from Princeton and a Harvard MBA. Her website is 888-4-HOLLIS. That's dash four dash hollis.com. Costa McCreas is the founder of ET Let's Talk and the global CE5 ET contact initiative and the People's Disclosure Movement. He is an author activist, international network, and online community leader promoting a peaceful contact between humans and extraterrestrial intelligence. He earned his B.A. in computer science from Indiana University. Go Big Red. Since 2006, his passion and mission has been the website ETLetstalk.com and the ET Let's Talk community, which has more than 6,000 members in 60 countries. And, of course, the website is ET let's talk.com i would like to welcome to the program hollis polk and costa mccreas costa welcome back hollis are you ready for the ride totally i'm yeah. excited now, so am i thanks for having me back yeah thank you so much costa thank you so much and i'm gonna i'm gonna throw this over to hollis first because and i did this to you last week with danny but i, <laughs> I, I promise costa i promise I, you're I, so you, consistent, dude. <laughs> yeah, you've got seat time tonight. No, no problem. But um, Hollis, I wanted to say welcome to the program for the first time. Uh, Costa's been on with this, as you know, a few times, and and uh, but it, this is just a conversation between friends, you know, in my living room. Let's just you know start where we start and end where we end. I'm very excited to have you here, and let's end the conversation tonight as friends. Are you ready to go? Totally. Same here. See, Nacosta is going to make sure he gets his in tonight. I, 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 it's a lot easier. He's sitting next to me. I guarantee it. Well, um, Hollis, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, let you both answer this question, but let's go let's go back to your childhood for a second before we hit the ground running. Did you? What was your family like? Were they open minded? Did 
Uh, did they talk about E.T.? Did you have any experiences as a, as a child? Um, hmm. Okay. As to, we never really talked about it, though I have to say when I was probably 11 or 12, um, Eric Von Daniken's first book, Chariots of the Gods, came out, and my dad gave it to me to read. If you think you're the first guest that's ever told me that, <laughs> no. you, you know, it's funny because that's my story, too. Oh, that, seriously? It, it, it really is. And, and, and so I can tell we're about the same age because you know, 1970, 71, when uh, and the movie started to come out and, and the book was there, I got the book. I don't know if I got the book from my mom, if she gave it to me or if I stole it from her. I'm not too sure. <laughs> how that how that happened but it certainly took this country over like a wave and yeah. and i was i was right there and i was part of it it was it was fascinating to me because i was already into ufos and the tv show like space 1999 and ufo and 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 those things coming out of britain but the full page ads that were in all the newspapers for uh chariots of the gods for the movie they they mesmerize. I would just sit there and stare at them and wonder if all of this could really be true. And and I don't think Von Daniken, even though I talked to him about this many many times directly, I'm I'm still not so sure if he realizes what happened in the United States when when the book and movie came out like it did. It took us over, didn't it? Well, okay. Right now is the first time I ever heard there was a movie. Oh, really? You didn't see yeah. the movie when you were 10? No. no. my dad. Okay, so I read really fast like my dad did. And so um, it was easier for him to give me books before he gave them to my mom. So if he read a good book, he'd give it to me. Mm. And so he was like, oh, you got to read this one. So I read that one and I thought, wow, that's really cool. But I have to say, um, I was not interested in UFOs. I was not interested in science fiction. I was fascinated from a very young age. I mean, like ridiculous, um, like five, six, uh, by the space program. Right. I had notebooks with clippings from the New York Times. I I listened as much as I could to like every launch um, because remember they were on radio back then. Right. Yes. Um, yes. You know, so that fascinated me, but. You know, anything science fiction or whatever didn't interest me at all. And how did the uh, the clairvoyant side of you start to surface? What, was your mother or father, uh, you know, given the gift? Uh, was it inherited? And, and when did you start to realize that there was something going on? Okay. So the first thing that happened, I literally remember being three years old and standing in the post office with my mom and my my little sister was in a baby carrier, just kind of how I know how you know how old I was. Um, and this man came running into the post office, and I knew instantly that he was really angry and that he was really angry at his wife, but I didn't know why. And so I said to my mom, why is that guy angry at his wife? And she said, don't do that. And what so, happened? And so I stopped, basically. Um, and then when I was about nine... It's, uh, I kept changing schools as a little kid, you know, didn't have to do with me really, but kept changing schools. And finally at about nine, it started to come back and I would just know things about people that there was no way I could really know. And, and people would tell me I was crazy and I was wrong. And so I, I just didn't tell anybody about it at all. And the, the, what I will say is when I was a teenager, if I'd get into a tough situation, um, and and I, I went to a boarding school, and so I traveled around the Northeast a lot by myself on buses. And, you know, bus stations are not in the world's best neighborhoods. Right. And so I would get into some kind of tough situations, and my God, th this voice would tell me what I needed to know to be safe. What, so, what Well, what kind of things uh, – we're going to be up against a break here in, in, in about four short minutes – when you know through that that age nine through your early what was it that you were seeing in people was it a bad side was it their future was it their end their demise uh oh nothing like that it's just like i would know why they were doing something that made no sense to me right 
And so I'd get information about like somebody's family life that I couldn't really have known that kind of stuff. Or like literally the, the one that this happened a bunch of times, but the one that stands out the most is I was standing alone about, I don't know, seven or eight o'clock, but it was December in downtown Troy, New York. And at that time they had raised downtown Troy for quote, urban renewal, unquote, but they had never built it back. And honestly, I haven't really been back, so I don't know if they ever built it again, but um, it was a bad neighborhood. And this car of uh, young guys kind of pulled up to me as I'm waiting for the bus. And this voice said, get back and get out of the light. Really? Yeah. And so I did that and they just moved on. Really? Yeah. That's kind of scary. Well, that, you know, it, well, they took care of me. My folks took care of me. Or, like, things would happen that it wouldn't make sense to me, and my guides would explain it, you know, very carefully. Um, like, people are – like, I got this at 14, that people are basically always projecting, and they don't ever see me. So I've, I've always kind of thought I was invisible, actually. And wow. I'm very – I'm actually very good at invisible, maybe because I believe that I am. Um but, you know, most of what people see in other people is their own projections. And so I just feel like, ah, it doesn't, you know, I've done cartwheels down the center aisle of a church. And, you know, whatever. <laughs> can you um, can you turn it on and turn it off? Or is it something that is, like, on all the time? Well, to be really good and really accurate, I need to feel safe. And so generally that means me sitting alone in a room talking to somebody on the telephone. That's when I'm really the best. Now, but what, I get other stuff all the time, but it's not, it's like a little bit here and a little bit there. It's not like a big thing. Well, I'm picturing, uh, okay, something like this. You're, you're purchasing a car. You're at a car dealership, right? And you're sitting there and there's a bunch of mayhem going on around you. Right. Different people. I mean, do you, do you feel all of that energy in the room and the conversations going on and the the people thinking and, and the negativity and the positivity? Can you shut that off or is that just like a bustling conversation in your head? Um, it's I, OK. I should explain that I don't feel I have intentionally, I think, shut down the feeling. Ah. So I get a little stuff in the outer parts of my aura, but it's not like I know people who are clairsentient and actually that has its own kind of pathology. I only know one person, one who's a really good clairsentient and really healthy. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, but, I'm, oh. but I'm clairvoyant. I'm clairaudient. Right. So I see and I hear. And I'm also kind of a, I'm also a telepath. Like, okay, let's put it out there. I'm a telepath. That's, that's like the last taboo, right? That is the clear sense that dare not speak its name. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. Because people freak out. But, the, and the truth is there are two parts of telepathy. There's sending and there's receiving. And you can be good at one and not at the other or, or good at both or neither, of course. But, you know, I'm good at sending. I'm pretty good at receiving, too. And so uh, we're going to be up against a break here in 15 seconds. And so, so I guess an, another way to look at it is, and this is my twisted way of looking at things, Hollis. So please uh, enjoy the, the stupidity that I have. <laughs> Just relish in it. Like you're at a checkout line, you know, and, and the person is, is, is ringing up, right, the cashier. It, do, do you have to block that off if she's having a bad day or is thinking about something at home? Do you, can you just pick up on it uh, like that? You know, I, I don't go there. And if somebody, I mean, I know if somebody's having a bad day, but I think that's sort of normal. Right. I, mean, I could be wrong about that. But to me, that's just like normal. Like somebody's acting upset. They're upset, but it's none of my business, right? There's a difference between being a clairvoyant and being a clairvoyeur. Right, 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 if it right. Doesn't, if it doesn't matter to me or to one of my clients, I'm not kidding. Yep, yep, yep. And I'm just worried about Costa is what I'm saying. He's got <laughs> he, he's got to run with pure thought. This is Fade to Black tonight. Costa McCreas and Hollis Polk. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. We out here.
here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRA Radio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Ray Sobs here once again to tell you about the Space and Alien Snowfest Ufology Conference taking place in the ski resort city of Big Bear Lake in sunny Southern California. What a lineup. Richard Dolan, Chase Kletzky, Micah Hanks, George Nori, Jason Martell, Jimmy Church, Linda Moulton Howe keynote speaker Stanton Friedman and more. Along with the speakers and lecturers, join the luncheon hosted by Jimmy Church. See a world-class UFO ET-themed ice sculpture contest with attendees voting the winner. Enjoy the quaint shops, restaurants, and pubs in Big Bear Lake Village and enjoy some of the best sky watching you can imagine. After the hectic holidays, gift yourself with a retreat the first week of February and come relax with us in a premier ski resort town high in the mountains of the Southern Sierras with an average of over 300 sunny days a year. Take advantage and book your lodging early and get your tickets now. Visit our website and register at Aliensnowfest.com. That's Aliensnowfest.com. Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, the deep right center. That goes Lewis to the wall. Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Back to Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Costa McCreas and Hollis Polk are with us. E.T. Let's Talk. And some other fun stuff. Tomorrow night, John Anthony West is going to be right here. He just got back from Egypt. We have a lot to talk about. And Wednesday night is our special Thanksgiving Eve broadcast. A tradition continues with Linda Moulton Howe. So what I was uh, saying before the break, I was just kind of giving Costa something to think about. That's all. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> With, oh, don't think I've thought about that all these years where we've been married now 18, 19 years. So 16, 16 years. <laughs> yeah. we've, been we, we've been together longer. And um, sure, I thought about that. In fact, uh, I thought about it in the very beginning before um, I, I really even decided to answer Hollis's email of introduction that, that brought us together. Uh, way back in the day when Match.com was new. And I, I can tell you that little ditty if you want to hear that. Wait, you guys got together through Match.com? In the yes, early days. we were one of the early success stories. Early adopters. Get out of here. Yeah. Wow. Well, oh, man. So there's a whole paranormal checklist on Match.com? I don't know. <laughs> no, but I was really out there. I basically said, look, I'm, I'm, my profile actually said I'm clairvoyant. 
and Claire Audien, and I will, and just know that if we spend any amount of time together, I will eventually read your mind. So you can imagine that um, as uh, I'm trolling, you know, on Match.com, oh, I'm sorry, as I was uh, <laughs> methodically uh, going through a process of, of trying to, to meet people, uh, women, um, that I encountered her profile, and it's a long story, and there's, there's a lot of funny things in it, but to speak directly to the point here that, that you're interested in, in, in Jimmy, um, when I read her profile and her very serious line about uh, uh, that if we spend any amount of time together, she would eventually read my mind, even though everything up until then had sounded good because I was filtering for many of the right things that mattered to me, you know, non-smoker sure. likes kids. Um, spirituality is open to psychic things and, and topics, uh, stuff that mattered. I hit that line though about reading my mind and that gave me pause. I did not answer her email because <laughs> I thought. <laughs> oh man. I'm a, that is, I, I, I have but, done hundreds and hundreds of shows. I got to tell you, I'm having a great moment right now. Yeah, that, well, that's okay. an incredible and, story. And, and, and here's what's going through my mind. It's like, oh, damn, why did she have to say that? Because I thought to myself um, that um, what guy wants to say a woman is going to read, her, read his mind? Because I did believe her. She sounded so credible. She had worked for the Psychic Readers Network uh, that used to advertise in late night TV, you know, uh, with nine, 800, 900 numbers back, 900 numbers, I think, back in the day. And she was one of their top oh. psychics who would interview other psychics. She was that good. So they sent me to AT&T to convince them that psychics were real. OK. And um, oh, OK. Yeah, AT&T still doesn't believe it, but that, that that's another story. I, I'm not making that up. But what I'm saying is she sounded so credible with her kind of psychic resume background that when she made that statement, um, uh, and Hollis reminded me that, yes, I did write to her first, but uh, our exchange kind of uh, faltered when, when I saw that profile. And I thought, what guy wants to know that a woman's going to read his mind because I can imagine the conversations, you know, I saw you looking at her, butt. no, I was not looking at her, butt. you know, I, I love only you. No, I know that. No, I know what you're thinking. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't want to live a life like that, you know, yeah, because you didn't, it was going to get you, busted all the time. Right. right. Yeah. You didn't look at her, butt, but you were thinking about it. I was thinking about <laughs> it. And boy, that's my crime, you know, 10 to 20 and Leavenworth for that one. Oh uh, man. Being a little flip about that. Be, but you understand that it, it, it did give me a little pause. Um, so there was a, a, a bit of a lapse because of that. And, and okay, to make a very long story short, it's many years later, and the truth is he's glad I can read his mind. <laughs> Insert joke here. I mean, I... I <laughs> well, the thing is, we, like, like a lot of people, though, eventually we... We finish each other's thoughts and spoken words anyway, or we'll have the same thought in the same moment. And and anybody who spent a amount of time with anybody else, uh, any amount of time, we'll start doing that anyway. And I think that's like a telepathy beginning. But but there are times she does pick up my thoughts. And, you know, I every now and then got good at picking hers up and being able to uh, – to, I won't say call her on something, but just to bring something up that astounded her. So in the end, you know, it, it's been a it's been a good thing. I think it's just if you take it in a positive way, it's just another natural course of the development between uh, of a great relationship between two people that they would be able to become telepathic in addition to becoming you know emotionally sensitive and getting along with each other, intellectually compatible. Well telepathically compatible and i really believe that in, in the in the future of the human race assuming we survive and i'm doing everything i can and i'm sure a lot of people are to make sure that we do as we enter a telepathic age with each other we will have to learn good manners um with our thoughts because we will um as you were just making that that that, that uh, example about the the checkout counter if a lot of us were able to pick up on each other's thoughts in a busy, bustling place like that, it could either be pandemonium if you're not compassionate or able to filter things um, or, or not. So we will have to adjust. And, and I think the way that it happens now between couples is just an example, like a forerunner of of how it's going to be. Yeah. And I would also say that the Internet is actually a precursor to telepathy and to widespread access probably to the Akashic Records. 
And again, the internet is about people learning good manners. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And and I, I, I definitely feel that the energy that is transmitted down these wires and and the connectivity throughout the globe, uh, it's it's an int- instantaneous connection. And you're, I, I totally agree with that. And that, that connectivity, that brain power where you have like-minded people all discussing the same thing, they are connected through these wires and, and your brain's you know, get connected as well. And, and attitudes and, and negativity can transmit too on, on the same side. Um, yeah. what, what I wanted to do really quick, I, I don't want to give you guys an opportunity to answer that. I want to back up because I know it's, it's just an easy th- I th- I think we all recognize that though, and that there is an age in front of us that it, and I think the internet is helping with that. Um, but I want to go back to 2006 um, and the formation of uh, ET Let's Talk. And the reason why I want to go there is I have interviewed so many people um, and also private conversations that have said going back to the 60s and the 70s where they have said that they were with somebody and they said, okay, they're going to be, we need to go to this location because something's about to happen there. I'm being, you know, and they go, Boom, and, there, and there's something waiting for them when they get there, whether it's in the sky or on the ground. And this this telepathic connection to E.T. has been around uh, for a while. There's enough testimony and, and evidence of this going on for a long time. And then 2006, you start E.T. Let's Talk. Was was it because of some of the experiences that have gone on historically that made you aware that this was possible, or did the, did the two of you have some experiences that led you in that direction? Uh, the, the answer to both of those is yes, and I'll I'll start with um, the context for my answer, which is uh, going back to the '60s that you mentioned. Um, I'm of the age that I was a child during the '60s. An elementary school, middle school, and high school, uh, and a tumultuous social, uh, scientific, all you know, time in, in so many areas. Um, unlike Hollis, I was into science fiction. Um, the space program uh, also captivated all of us. Of course, you know the, the the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions just enthralled the world. Regardless of whether you believe we went to the moon or not, you know we um, we. We saw something on television that did enthrall the world, and I was certainly part of it. Uh, Star Trek came out. So the, the, the formative years um, for me were about space, about science fiction, about possibilities, about the vastness of the universe. I, I should mention I also owned a small reflector telescope, and I was in my backyard in Indiana always looking up at the stars and fiddling around with the telescope and just marveling at the magnification I was getting and, and just feeling a tug as I would look up out there at the cosmos, uh, because I was of a scientific mathematical bent, I knew what the distances were like out there and how much there was out there. And I just, just felt a sense of awe. Um, And I've heard other people describe this too, like, wow, I'm just a, a little grain of sand here. And there is this infinity out there that is alive. And I I couldn't put it into words, but it it was magic for me. So that's the context I came from. Um, I should mention, I picked up a couple UFO books, you know, Incident at Exeter and others that were uh, prevalent at the time. Um, Unlike today, you know, there, there isn't a, uh, an avalanche of books, you know, you, you, you got what you could at the drugstore in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I did. And I was enthralled by that, too. I just knew right away that those flying discs must be visiting. I um, wanted to meet them. I wanted to know more about them. But there was really no way to do that. And so I dropped the interest and just went on what we would call a normal life, uh, graduating from, from college, computer science, math, going to work, coming out to California, um, getting into my first marriage, having a couple kids, working in the Silicon Valley for 40 years as an independent software engineer, um, eventually divorcing and then remarrying. And that brings me fast forward up to 2006 that you're talking about, Jimmy. So by then I was primed, yeah, because I had the, the childhood interest in so many things that involved you know, the sky. 
um, I discovered that there were retreats going on at Mount Shasta here where people would go out under the stars and use these things called the CE5 protocols to to make human-initiated contact uh, rather than just being passive with the um, the CE1, 2, 3, and 4s. The CE5 was different because uh, human intention and goodwill, consciousness, and thought were used proactively to send out a message to ET and then hope that you would get a message back and establish some kind of interaction. Right. Right. That captivated me, and I decided to go for a week uh, to, to this retreat, uh, along with 40 other people at Mount Shasta, Northern California, just to just to see. And part of me was, was real excited. I'd never heard about this before, but I wanted to try. And part of me was a little bit scared because I grew up with all the science fiction Hollywood movies about how evil every civilization that, that seemed to come here wanted something from us as if as if they were lacking everything in the world, you know, our, our women, minerals, whatever. It just seemed like we were always the targets, if you watch the movies, of some evil bad alien guys uh, coming after Earthlings. So I had swallowed a lot of that, in, that programming very consciously, and that was a, the little bit of fear I had, you know, as I contemplated spending this week at Mount Shasta. But I went anyway. It was like, no, I'm going to put my for- forward. And um, fortunately... Um, Hollis was supportive. Yeah, actually, Costa wanted me to go with him. And I said, oh, honey, you know, it doesn't really pull me. Um, I'm sure it's all real, but it's just not part of my life. You know, I have a business to run and, you know, go, have a good time, enjoy it. Did, but I, I'm going to stay home. Well, did either of you, that's an interesting uh, statement, Hollis. Uh, Costa's up into, I'm going to come back to that. Hollis, uh, uh, Costa, uh, up to that point in 2006 or, or, or around that time when you went to Mount Shasta, had you had a sighting before that, before you went to Shasta? No, I had not. But I will tell you that um, – Two people that I trusted, close family members or friends of family, had had up close and personal sightings. And I, I emphasize the word trust because, again, I grew up in the 60s and there were certain friends of mine who had sightings, but they were high on acid. Right, right, right. So I was careful when, when huh. people told me stories to look at them and go, okay, were you straight? Were you awake? Were you conscious? Were you with us? Um and there were a couple of people like that. Uh, the girlfriend of my brother back in my youth, in my 20s, had a, a disc literally fly over her car in the uh, the rural part of Indiana as she was driving home. She lived out outside in, in, in the boonies and was driving to her farmhouse. And this thing paced her car and then just came right over. The, the, the engine died. You know, a classic kind of story. And she was frightened and it hovered over the car silently uh, circular, 30 feet. She saw the rotating red, blue, green lights underneath. Um, a, a beam of light shone down, but it, it didn't do anything. And then it just kind of zipped away, and she was able to start the car. And she could still see it pacing her as she continued to drive home, although it was more of the distance. When she got to her driveway, the, the lights of the house were dark, but there was another car pulling into the driveway, and it happened to be her sister just pulling up, her sister could not wait to get out of the car and said, hey, sis, you'll never believe what I just saw. Out in the distance, I saw this weird light, you know, on the way to the house going back and forth, you know, zooming up and down and then stopping. And they compared stories. So from two different directions, they had encountered the same thing, one of them very close and personal and the other one somewhat more of a distance. So I knew other people that had stories like that, but I did not have mine yet, yet until that week um, in Shasta, when it all just started happening for me, um, happily. And that's why we're having this conversation, because I can honestly say that that was uh, a game changer, a life changer uh, for me. Uh, because, Jimmy, it's one thing to hear other people's stories, uh, people who you trust, and you can, you, can, you can say intellectually, you know, I believe you, so they're real. But then you have your own, and you go, holy crap. Yes. So, this is real, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's in my body now. It's, it's, I've internalized it. And what am I going to do with 
what I know now, what, what, with what my own eyes have seen, my own ears have seen, what am I going to do with it? It's not intellectual. It's part of all of me now. Right, right. I'm here talking to you now because I, I figured that out and decided I wanted more and to organize other people to do that. And I can go into detail about the experience I had there because it'll, it reflects on and interrelates with um, changes for Hollis as well. Well, you know what's funny, um, and we're going to uh, talk about Shasta right now, it, but w Rita and I, when we first met, which was back in, you know, 1998, you know, right right, right in there, 1998, I had um, over at my house uh, 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 a collection of videos, right? And you open it, you open up the door to the, the cabinet for the videotapes, right? And you see all the normal stuff, the Godfather and, you know, what have you, right? Pornography, then, usual, right, right, yeah. Yeah, then you go to the second shelf, and it's like, <clears throat> it's all UFOs, right? It's just, it's just packed. And, and I know... You know, she kind of tripped on it, and I had this huge, you know, UFO collection, and, you know, what's this guy about? And over <laughs> the years, you know, we talk about it all the time, but, uh, you know, it, I think that she, rightly so, was always just a little bit skeptical, but she's also, you know, Russian, Greek, Armenian that 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 is very open-minded, not only to the subject of ufology, but spirituality and the paranormal too, as well. I mean, they've all got, you know, their beliefs uh, with that now, but, but fast forward, uh, being a skeptic is one thing, but like you said, then when you ha have that experience together in Hollis, I want you to note, write down what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> this is what happened to us is we were driving in the car. It's a famous story now, but but it's relative to this conversation. We're driving in the car, 1030 at night, driving down into the valley here in, in Southern California, and Rita has a sighting. She goes, uh, I can't use the words that she used, but <laughs> WTF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and she yells it, and she's looking up. It's 1030 at night. We had the sunroof open. And she's looking out through the, the sunroof of the car. And uh, this is on a mountain road. Anyway, so I look where she's looking. And sure enough, it was this white ball. That's the only large that streaked down from the sky through past the sunroof down the center of the windshield right to where I was driving. And it looked like it crashed in downtown Van Nuys. And I was waiting for an explosion. And and it didn't happen, uh, but she saw it first. I saw it. I immediately called uh, Wolf McCarran over at Mufon right then, uh, and said, "You know, we had the sighting." But the point is, we saw it together, and we know what we saw. Nobody can change our experience, and and it was just it was it was profound. It was amazing. And the other thing was that was most amazing about it was I followed, I did the report to MUFON, but then I followed the news. I, I immediately went home and jumped on the internet. There's nothing there. I followed the LA Times, KBC 7, CBS, NBC, everything for the next week looking for any reports of this, and there were none. And we're talking a million people plus that live in the Valley, and at 1030 at night, you would have thought that somebody else saw it and made a report or called into the police or called to the news or whatever, nothing anywhere, but it doesn't change what we saw. We saw it together. And, uh, that was a, that was a turning point. It was an amazing experience. So I, I, I totally understand that, Jimmy. I mean, thanks for sharing that because, um, uh, when it happens with between two people like that, who are partners, you know, it, it can be quite the bond that, that brings you together, and it's kind of a door opening into further exploration of other things because now you know each other's not crazy, and you can just set all that aside and and spare your energy for exploration in a positive way, in a cooperative way from that point forward. That's right. What, and what I, happened I, with I, me was uh, in, in Shasta, um, I would – I. During the nights, I saw many things in the sky and was taught how to uh, recognize what would be the normal terrestrial stuff, aircraft, satellites, um, weather phenomenon, weather balloons, Chinese lanterns, flights of geese, um, 
Republicans in flight. I, you know, I don't know what. I mean, we were taught about a lot of things. And yet, filtering all that out, uh, we were seeing stuff in the sky multiple times, a whole group of people validating each other that was zigzagging, pulsing, communicating, uh, laser shining at them. They would pulse back in the same number of laser flashes that you would give, you know, repeatedly, all kinds of stuff like that. So that was exciting. It, it was first time for me. It was new. And I had a whole group of other people also seeing it so that if I were doubting my own sanity, um, I didn't have to. Um, I had a lot of other witnesses. However, for me, the, the, the coup de grace was one night on around midnight, I think, we had just had a, a group meditation outside in a, um, in a clearing, in a forest clearing with a, a spot on beautiful view of Mount Shasta there in the night. Uh, we were in a wooded area, but there was this clearing and we were just breaking up after the med meditation to go back to our cars. And then someone tugged on my sleeve and pointed silently at an area right on the edge of the clearing where there were trees starting. And, and it was only like 10 feet away. Eight feet, you know, I mean, I didn't have a tape measure, but it was close. And what I saw was slowly uh, a materializing sphere, a three-dimensional sphere, probably six feet across, opaque, that was kind of coming, fading into view, floating a foot, something like that, above the forest floor, very silently, quietly, and you could tell it was there. And... Uh, I don't know about you, but I've never seen anything materialize in front of my eyes. You know, maybe at a magic show when a magician pulls something, but this was this was so much better than than you know uh, artificial magic. It really happened, and there were probably nine other people in our group who were also staring at the same thing. So another case in point of the fact I had some um, some backup there uh, as to what we were seeing. Well, it stayed there for half an hour, like I said, opaque, not moving, not making a sound, floating. And the cool thing about having a group of people like that is, um, as in my marriage here, the other person's person can have other abilities that will augment what it is you're seeing. So while my physical eyes were like a gog and seeing all this, there were other people in the group who were able to look inside uh, psychically or, or were telling us we're getting a telepathic message from the occupants of this thing. And one person said, we're scientists inside. They, they tell me, and this person was announcing to the group, they tell me that um, they're here to study human energy systems. And okay, that was very cool. And um, I didn't see them, but others could see them. You know, they were small bipedal beings, uh, white, translucent. Um, and what's interesting is that the woman next to me, like literally next to me, um, Christine, suddenly was standing still for most of the half hour, like uh, stiff like a board with her arms outstretched, not moving for half an hour. I didn't know what was going on, but I stayed by her just kind of wondering, what is this going on? I'm not going to leave now uh, until I figure this out. At the end of the half hour, when this uh, sphere dematerialized, you know, slowly just kind of did a, f a fade to black uh, huh. <laughs> for all of us. Christine just kind of shook and convulsed and was very disoriented. And, you know, I asked her, are you okay? What happened? And she told me that um, she had been approached telepathically by one of the beings inside the sphere, one of the scientists. And they had said to her, they had asked her, do you mind if we merge with you to study your human aura? This is of interest to us. And she said, well, okay. Uh, she was pretty psychic herself and open to these things. And she gave them three conditions, if I recall, which was, well, if you're going to merge with me, uh, I don't want to be like knocked unconscious. I want to be at least semi-aware of my surroundings of who I am. Uh, the second point is um, no funny sex stuff. Right. You know, being a woman, you know, your mind goes to that. Right, um, and, right. And, and understandably so. No, being a guy, your mind goes to that, too. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's yeah, be clear yeah. here. Okay, we're very clear. We, we know one of your secret fears now, Jimmy. Okay. Um, and the third point was um, you leave when I ask you to leave. And the, the being agreed. And so what was happening is I was standing next to her for this almost half hour was all that was going on. I just didn't know it in real time until she told me the story later. Right. And she related that same story to the group in an afternoon session the following day. Pretty profound. Um, so – I'm getting to the part where Hollis can 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 break in here. Uh, 
it was my habit every morning of these five or six nights after each night to call Hollis, who was back home, uh, and spend about an hour just giving her a download of what I was seeing. It was just always jaw dropping for me. You know, ooh, ooh, saw this, ooh, saw that. And she was patient and listened. Um, along about, I think, the fourth night, a fourth morning, when I called her to give her my report from the following night, uh, she said, uh, just stop right there. I've got a story for you. And I go, what? What do you mean? Okay, what's going on? So actually it was, I think, the fifth or sixth morning, but whatever. Um, so the night before, I had been sitting in bed about probably 10.30 or so. I was reading in bed, and I put down the book, and I turned out the light. Uh-oh, I think maybe our friends are here. No, I've stopped the echo. All right. Um, turned out the light. And uh, you know how you turn out the light and then you're like, you're still kind of sitting up and then you have to like slink down into the bed to, to go to sleep. Right. So I'm still sitting up and I notice there are these four and probably a fifth one behind them, but these four little beings arranged around the foot of the bed. Wow. Looking at me. Whoa, and whoa. they're, they're um, three and a half to four feet tall. They were white. They were not um, completely material. Um, a friend of mine later described beings of light, and I think they probably were made of light, which begs the question, were they holograms or whatever? But anyway, there's these four little bipedal beings, slightly large heads, uh, um, standing around looking at me. And the thing is, they were so sweet and so loving. And I just got this message, who are you? And that's all they wanted to know. Who are you? Wow. 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 Yeah. And this and was, but this was the same evening that Costa had his experience. Is that what you're saying? That may be, I won't swear to that, but if, if it wasn't the same evening, it was one of those evenings. I mean, clearly, I was making ET connection of my own then, and because I was, uh, I'm so close, you know, as my wife, and I was talking to her. I really believe that on an energetic level, and many of these ETs uh, are are psychic and very spiritually advanced in their own ways. I believe they were tuning into the energy strands for me, uh, where I was putting a lot of heart energy and communication energy, and probably following them dimensionally or interdimensionally back to like. A point of destination and wondering to themselves, okay, where's all this energy going? What's at the other end? You know, maybe they were curious. So my guess is, you know, this is just speculation that I was having an intense experience. They followed my energy all the way back to my home. Right. To, to Hollis. And, and actually, I'd like to second that because a couple of years later, Costa and I were both up in Mount Shasta and a third person came with us and he was actually a stranger then, but he's become a good friend now. And his wife was at home. And she's actually very psychic. Um, and while he was up at Shasta, everybody was showing up in her living room. Well, did you, that's interesting. And that night that they showed up at the foot of the bed, you know, you click off your light and there they are. Mm -hmm. Did you make a connection uh, back to Costa uh, on the event? Well, I mean, I told him the next morning, but not, no, I mean, look, I was completely unprepared. All right. <laughs> yeah. Who's prepared for that? I, I was completely right. shocked. And probably for the only time in my life, my mind went completely blank. Were you scared? No, they were so sweet. They were so, they just like exuded love. There was clearly nothing to be afraid of. Did you think E.T.? What were you thinking? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. But I was just so shocked. It took me, I don't know, maybe 45 seconds or a minute. I mean, who knows? Because time kind of stands still in that, in when you're so shocked. Um, it took me a while before I thought, you know, I should probably ask them something. Something profound, right? Here and we are. All I, and, okay, and here's the thing. All I could think to ask them was, where are you from? Well, that's good. That's better than what I did. What did <laughs> I want. I wanted to fight. You know, I did. I did. I wanted to. I wanted to uh, go into Rambo mode. But uh, so you. You and did they answer you? Yes. And what they say? 
Well, so here's the thing. Very slowly in my mind, this word formed. Arcturus. Like that. And I had never consciously heard of it. Right. So the next morning when... Um, you know, I told Costa the, so the story and I said, here's what I heard. And I, and I kind of remember saying to him, is that a place? And of course, because I had studied astronomy as a kid, I go, Arcturus, of course, it's yeah. a star system. It's, it's well known to basic, you know, astronomy 101. Um, and I knew that she had not grown up with an interest in astronomy per se like that. So she wouldn't consciously, like she said, know of those places. But of course I was delighted and thrilled. So she's, relating the story to me that you just heard and my jaw has hit the floor because i thought i was going to wow her with what happened with right, me right 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 of course she, she trumped that in a nice nice way and uh i think at that point she said something like you know you went to this retreat i stayed home as next year i'm coming with you cowboy yeah you know? i did like next year i'm coming with you I, because I, that I'm, one's I'm, real to me okay now it is part of my life. Yeah, Rita and I are going with you next time. <laughs> You're welcome. But let's uh, yeah. let me let me back up for a second, Costa, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, were you? I hate to say the word clairvoyant because it's too broad of a spectrum, right? It's just it's too broad of a stroke. But did, were you? Did you consider yourself just like? And normal's the wrong word too, as well. <laughs> you know, but but let's find the right label for. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, and I think you know where I'm going. You know, so at at Shasta, you know, with uh, uh, Christine, I think you said her name was. She's next to you. She's you know she's got a gift, and she's connecting. But were you just were you a fly on the wall for all of these experiences? And are you suggesting that? Anybody that you don't have to be clairvoyant or or uh, are are you saying that anybody can go and experience something like you went Absol through? Absolutely. I um how I consider myself a normal guy. I'd been into meditation for a number of years, but uh, having any overt gifts like that, no. Now since then, I've developed a little bit of clairaudience. But back then, no. And, and that was what was real special because I could then go back and tell people in the community that I was starting to – that I would start to build at etletstalk.com, look, I'm an average Joe, you know, no different than you. If I can do this without any special gifts, and I'm not putting those down. I mean, if you've got them, they enhance the experience. Sure. But – I'm an everyday kind of guy, and this happened to my external vision and in the company of nine other people. Um, so I know I'm not making this up. I was straight arrow and, and, and awake and conscious and everything. So go on. Um, and I want to add, too, when those beings showed up at the foot of the bed, that was nothing psychic. I saw that with my eyes, and, and I'll be very clear about clairvoyance. I don't think it's a broad brush at all. Um, there are two kinds of clairvoyance. There's internal, where you see pictures and get information, which is what I do, and there's external clairvoyance, which is seeing people's energy fields usually, is occasionally seeing you know beings that are not physically material, whatever. I, my external clairvoyance is not that good, and in particular kind of light, certainly not the complete darkness. Um, I can see auras a little bit. I don't see colors. Um, you know, it's not that good. So I saw that with my normal human eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, now that the, 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 the word forming inside my mind, A, that was definitely telepathic, and B, I, it's possible that I could have somewhere in the dim recesses of my memory, you know, certainly beneath my conscious memory, um, have heard the word. So it's possible that I made that up, but the, the beings that were standing there were standing there. I saw them with my eyes, I, you know, and like any other human being could. How did they, li how did they leave you that they night? They just disappeared. That's it, right? They didn't yep. walk? They just... Uh, no, they faded. just eventually, they kind of faded out. But I mean, they faded out really quickly. It's like they were there and maybe, maybe it took like a second for them to just disappear. Right. They also did a fade to black, Jimmy. There you go. They did, and, and given how dark it was in the room, they did literally fade to black. Did you, <laughs> did you turn on the light? No. Were Why you, would it? Well, I did. When it, when it happened to me, I was... <laughs> 
I was I was out of my mind. You know, I slept with the lights on for ten years after that. So- oh, well, wait, what happened to you? And how old were you? Uh, I was uh, uh, twenty. Uh, I was probably thirty, thirty two, thirty three. Um, this was uh, nineteen ninety five, so it was uh, twenty years ago, and I was living alone. And, uh, I, it just, you know, I've, t- I told the story so many times guys. And so I don't want to, I don't want to bog down, you know, okay. tonight's show with this, but, um, I, I, I woke up at two or three o'clock in the morning. I'm not too sure what time it was, but, uh, there were, I knew that somebody was in my bedroom and I was sleeping on my back and I woke up and I thought. Um, at the time I thought that I was being burglarized. That's what I thought. I thought, I thought that I was going to wake up and, and, and have a really bad experience. But when I opened up my eyes, I couldn't move, you know, that sleep paralysis thing, but I looked down, I could move my eyeballs and I looked down, my head was propped up on a pillow. I was lying on my back and I looked down and off to the right, uh, standing next to my, not next to my bed, but off to my right in front of my sliding glass doors was this dude standing there. And I could tell how tall he was because next to him, I had a speaker on a stand um, uh, uh, next to my TV set that was, you know, maybe four feet tall. And he was, you know, a a little bit taller, but it looked like, you know, about the same height as that. Anyway, standing there looking at me. And I could see because he was standing in front of the sliding glass doors, the illumination of the moon and the stars, you know, nighttime outside. My room wasn't dark. It wasn't black. You know, I could see everything. And uh, and I could clearly see what was going on. I could see him from the waist up. And uh, and he blinked a couple of times. And, it, and, and we had this standoff. And it went on for about 15 minutes. And and I was getting I, – I went from scared to being kind of angry. And finally, I I jerked over and turned on the light to my left and then went to my right uh, for a confrontation, and he was gone. And so I went through my whole house, uh, turned on all the lights uh, to make sure I was alone, and, uh, you know, I went back to my bedroom and was like, man— you know, it was just, uh, it was an intense experience. And that's that's what I saw. Was he a gray? I don't know. Was he this? I don't know. Was I, 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 don't, I don't have those answers. I only know what I saw. And, uh, and that's it. And, um, and, and, and I don't, there was other things to the story that I keep to myself because when I talk to other people, I want to hear their experience and I want to compare notes. So, you know, there's, there's more to it to that, but you know, I'll just keep the rest of it to myself, but that was basically it. It was a 15 minute experience. Now would, would that, uh, did you style that as an, uh, an ET experience or interdimensional being? And, you know, and then labels kind of start getting funny and we've had conversations about this, but what did you put a label on that? I, in any I, way? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit tough to go in any different, uh, direction, uh, for me because, the sliding glass door was closed. I'm in Sherman Oaks, California. Uh, there's a lot of population there. There's, you know, so uh, were, was there any reports of any craft that night? No, I wasn't. Bit, I wasn't able to follow up, up with any of that. So, you know, was it anything else? You know, was it the devil and Daniel Johnston? You know, was it that kind of? I don't know. You know, I I really don't know. Uh, uh, anything more than that. And I, I, um, uh, I don't, you know, I, I just don't know. I just don't know how he, he got in and how he got out. That's the part for me that was pretty trippy. If the sliding glass door was open. Okay. Then we have some more answers here. Um, you know, when I went to turn on the light, he dashed out the door, but the door was closed and that kind of freaked me out. Did that experience lead you, you talked about the, the, the UFO tapes when you met uh, Rita a few years later, was that, uh, an experience there that, um, led you to more exploration and into a, a whole slew of those tapes or not? No, no, it had nothing to do with it. And all of that was completely independent. And as a matter of fact, after that happened to me, I didn't tell anybody about it or share it. And I blocked it out of my mind. 
it was a it was a terrifying experience and i did not dig it i did not think it was fun or funny or and and it's never happened again either and i you know that if it would have been repetitive then i would have been able to use the experience uh you know but no it never happened again all i know is what happened there was a couple of other little things that were there in little details but uh, like i said i keep that to myself because when i inter look when somebody tells me Costa is and, and Hollis. When somebody tells me a, an experience similar to this, instead of me brushing it off and not showing interest, I, I, I know my own experience, you know, so I just stop and I listen and I have to appreciate it for what it is. And, and that's, that's there. The, the UFO stuff that that's gone on since my childhood and I've done nothing but collect. And, you know, when, when, um, when uh, the Roswell incident came out, I got that when it first hit the, you know, when uh, Colonel Corso and and uh, uh, what's his name uh, wrote that book, uh, Day After Roswell, I bought that the day it came out. Uh, when uh, the, when <laughs> all of that, I was, I was fully into it. I bought all of the books and, mm -hmm. uh, and no, I was uh, fully into it. There was um, uh, next to my house. Oddly enough, oh, I I, I got to get back to uh, uh, I got to get back to the Shasta experience. So let's not uh, let me segue too far here. Next to my condo in Sherman Oaks was uh, a Tower Records, and I would go into Tower and tell the guy at the front counter, "Okay, any more UFO videos?" You know, we're talking nineteen, <laughs> you know, nineteen. This is nineteen ninety, eighty nine, ninety, ninety one. And I would go in there and go, dude, yeah, we got a new one in. And that's it. I would buy it. <laughs> and, and, and I just, I collected that stuff. I collected it. And, and uh, I couldn't, uh, those guys, uh, if anything new came out, they would order it. I would get a phone call and, go, you know, they would let me know that uh, new stuff came in. So, no, I, I constantly uh, uh, collected it. I still have a few, um, you know, I've moved on to DVDs, but... Uh, <laughs> But now, yeah, that's uh, only the format changing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, now let's. I, I want to go back to Shasta though. So um, that you you had described that the 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 ball was opaque. The the sphere was opaque. So I'm picturing, was it like a giant pearl? You know, was it like that? Was it when you say it was opaque? Was it a solid white ball? It was a grayish white. Okay. Uh, and it was a, like a sphere. It wasn't like a pearl drop shape, but um, it had that definition. And believe me, I, I, at, at the first, I stared at it, making sure that it, it wasn't the, the partial moon playing tricks on my eyes with shadows or angles of the light coming through, whatever. Because, you know, I, w I by then was learning to discern and to go down a checklist of is it this is it this is it this before right. I get to the ooh ah part like oh my god it's it's anomalous, um, so I, I went through that checklist and that's what I saw it was just a sphere it was opaque, believe me I would have wanted to look into it, um, and and what's interesting I forgot to mention was that after it dematerialized, uh, and and during well actually backing up during the time it was there we were talking in hushed tones. Uh, nobody even pulled out a camera. We had cameras among us, you, and, and and I don't recall hearing you know whir, click, 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 uh, at all. It was almost as time was suspended during that. But but afterwards, one or two of the guys, as we started talking, this thing had gone. Said, "Oh my God, look at my face." They they had a burn, like a sunburn that hadn't been there before. It wasn't painful, but but their complexion was red. Like, you know, they had, like I said, just spent the wrong amount of time in the sun. And, you know, we checked that out. And and that hadn't been there a half an hour ago. So they had they had some kind of a physical effect. That's kind of just like an aside. There was really no, no here nor there about it except the fact that that happened. Well, Jacques Vallée uh, talks about that all the time. I find that interesting. How far, how far away was the sphere from you? I would say... A, about six feet, seven feet. Say what? Yeah. Oh no, you didn't. Oh, that's a that's a whole nother experience. That's not a CE five. That's a CE <laughs> nine. Yeah, I uh, six. Big... Wait, wait a minute here. 
Did you? Why didn't you touch it? Did you touch it? I was afraid to. Did it, did it smell? Six no. feet? No, there, there was no phenomenon. It was silent. It sat there. Um, no smell. The wind didn't do funny things. The scenery didn't change. Uh, at one point, I thought, I wonder if I can touch this. And I, I quickly, I, I dismissed that notion. It's like, I don't know what the hell that is. And, and I'm, I don't want to be experiment A, you know, if if I do touch it and, you know, something happens. So I didn't do it. But, but I, I stood back with everyone else kind of really respectfully um, as people were talking in hush whispers and saying things like, oh, there's scientists inside. Mm-hmm. They, they told us they're here. So I was listening to my my cohorts as well as keeping an, an eye on it too. And that was my life-changing experience. As you were saying earlier, Jimmy, no one can tell you you didn't you know, see that. No one can mm-hmm. tell you move right along, nothing to see here, nothing to see here. It's like, hell no. That, that was mine. I've internalized it. Now what I'm gonna what am I gonna do with it? Well, no, I want to know what you said to Hollis when you got home. I, that's well, what I I mean. She had her experience. She told you about that on the phone. But now you need to come home and go. Okay, honey, uh, six feet in front of me, a six foot sphere, and uh, now I don't want you to answer, Costa. I'm throwing this over to Hollis. No, but uh, he said it on the phone. What? No, but you guys had to talk about it forever. You know, this is an experience. How did you take it when uh, – were you cool with it? Well, of course, because I would had my experience. I mean, okay. lucky enough that we both walked through a kind of uh, perceptual door into a new reality right. at about the same time. Interesting. Um, and now, now that you guys look back, and this was – this was 2005, 2006, so this was 10 years ago, right? 2006, yeah. 2006. Uh, have you guys uh, started to put a correlation together uh, between the two events with Shasta and Northern California? Back to your house? Because I think there is, I, I, but I don't want to use the power oh, of suggestion. You know what? We haven't, we've taken it on face value as, as we've described it here, and we haven't looked – and maybe we should, but we haven't found it necessary to look for any deeper correlation because you know why? Yeah. The following year, Hollis came back to Shasta with me and has been back. We've been back together to Shasta as well as other places almost every year with some lapses since then. And what I'm saying is we've had so many new experiences together, stories that we don't even have time to – we'll tell some of them here if you want us to. Other stories like these that have happened, so it's not like – this was an event that happened once, and we're still talking about it and trying to figure it out. Nah, no, we, we just we, accept that, it. We just accept it. There's, there's other life out there. They're, they have figured out ways to come here. Um, and that's why I decided to found the, the ET Let's Talk community and the, the Global CE5 initiative, where we get coordinated groups of people together all over the world to use our consciousness to make our human-initiated contact. That's what spurred my interest. Um, I realized that the activities of the group that week in Shasta were responsible. E- ET intelligence was responding to our meditation and what we were doing and our, our invitations with open hearts. And if we could do it once, one night, we could do it another. We could do it the next week, the following month, the following year. So I thought a community needs to, to come together around this because – this is something new. They're bold people who are willing to try this. Right. Um, what is it that we can discover? This is like a frontier. This is like, you know, uh, the Europeans setting out on the oceans to, to find new continents and all that. And I feel that the People's Disclosure Movement, which I also founded, is that. It's, it's that exploration that has all of us coming together to compare notes, uh, to share stories, to give each other support a safe place to tell our stories Uh, for example the reason hollis and i are here is because you're a safe place to tell our story you know um, i I would not relish having to be on another kind of radio show and 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 having somebody in my face every other sentence Uh, i feel this is a safe place i wanted to create a community where people like you and me and hollis and so many others that i've uh, talked to since then and i correspond with 
hundreds of people all over the world all the time. And they tell me the same things that they've been looking for a place where they could open up their mouths finally because they were shut down as kids. They could not talk about this with spouses, partners, whatever. But when they found the etletstalk.com community, uh, just like you and I are having this conversation, there was someone friendly on the other end going, oh, yeah, me too. I didn't know that. Hey, did you think about this? And, and suddenly a conversation happens and something new gets born uh, in the terms of discovery instead of obstructionism and criticism. It's like, yeah, we've all shared this. Now where do we go with it? And that's what the community is now. We're um, uh, just recently now become 7,000 people in more than 60 countries. I think the People's Disclosure Movement is probably about 20,000 people when you include other networks that, that have started alongside mine. Um, and they're all over the Internet now. And this is a happy thing because I believe that a lot of people are waking up with these questions. We're discovering each other. We're giving each other the tools, the CE5 uh, protocols, to do our own investigation. Uh, you, know, you know as well as I do that governments have lied to us for decades about the UFO ET truth. There's, and you know, I don't need to go into all the stories about the control groups and all that. I mean, a lot of your listeners are, are aware that there's been a cover-up for many reasons but now we have the opportunity with the people's disclosure movement and what we're doing at etletstalk.com to join together and just say well the government stuff is kind of irrelevant yeah we can wait for governments to disclose and make a big announcement uh, and I for one would love to see that happen but we're not waiting for that with the people's disclosure movement it, it's it's us uncovering our own truth now and sharing our information with each other. And I'm not saying we know the whole truth, we, the, the, all the pieces. We're discovering little, little by little uh, as we tell our stories. Every month when I hold the Global CE5 Initiative events, which I have now for five years, reports come back to me from uh, my teams in uh, all kinds of countries, uh, urban areas, suburban, rural, etc., of encounters that people have had. And so I know that there's something going on. All these people cannot be crazy all at the same time, right. month after month, year after year. And they upload the reports onto the website. I've got some Facebook group pages going where people can talk about it. There's other groups on Facebook as well, other networks where people are actively now sharing, discussing techniques, the results, sharing videos, pictures. We've got a movement, and this makes me very happy. Because having grown up in the 60s when a lot of great movements were born and that I was a part of, I was a, a spiritual and political activist in the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement back then, the environmental move, move, movement, um, the women's movement, um, so many. It, it's very natural for me to think of what's happening right now in those terms, like this is something really special and powerful, another movement that we are self-organizing right now. And I want people out there to know that the center is everywhere. Yes, yes. Well, let me jump in real quick. We're up against a break. And uh, now, after the break, I want you two to think about this. I want to talk about the second trip to Shasta a year later. This is Fade to Black tonight. Costa McRae and Hollis Polk. I'll be right back. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. Why do people order Life Change Tea? Because Life Change Tea helps the digestive system. Life Change Tea helps the colon unclog. The tea also helps with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and many, many other health issues. Life Change Tea also tastes great. And Life Change Tea is not just green tea. Life Change Tea is a unique blend of eight different herbs that go to town, cleaning your body of harmful toxins, bacteria, and parasites. Our tea is number one. Are you ready for your life change? Let the tea help you. Log on to our online store of helpful products to get your body on track. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Or you can call us at 928-308-0408. That's 928-308-0408. Not all tea is equal. Read our website of all the factual testimonies that prove that Life Change Tea is working. Health is important, and our quality of life is very important. Don't wait to order. Expect a life change with Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. 
Are you a paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, or UFO sky watcher? If so, FNGinnovations.com has the product you definitely need in your investigations kit or go bag. Introducing the Morpholite Wide Beam Tactical Flashlights that put the light where you need it most. Traditional flashlights shine a focused round beam with limited line of sight in the dark. Morpholite Tactical Flashlights change all that, utilizing a revolutionary wide beam design to enable you to see safety hazards such as hanging wires and steel, pipes and holes in the floor you just can't see with a focused round beam. In the field, where safety is paramount, a 180 degree beam increases orientation and peripheral vision in the dark. Morpholite flashlights are ideal for investigations in abandoned facilities such as houses and hospitals, factories, caves and tunnels. Avoid those low hanging tree branches that poke your eyes in the woods. Visit FNGinnovations.com to see a full line of tactical lights and accessories. That's FNGinnovations.com. Now you can find all your favorite talk radio shows live all in one place at TalkStreamLive.com. Listen from anywhere, office, home, or in your car. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com and click on one of the many live talk show hosts you want to listen to. It's free and easy. No computer? Download the smartphone apps. Never miss your favorite talk show. Find them all at TalkStreamLive.com. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back to Fade to Black. Tonight, very special guests, Costa McCreas and Hollis Polk are with us tomorrow night. John Anthony West is here. And then Wednesday, Linda Moulton Howe. So, hey, guys, I was uh, uh, right before the break. I have to I have to know a, a year later. Now, Hollis goes with you, Costa, and you guys go back to Shasta and and share this experience hollis uh what happened okay you know we kind of heard you before the break and so we were talking about it i kind of have a problem in that i can't tell you what happened what year like they everything kind of runs together because i remember things like i sort by place and so ever like everything happened in the same place. So I literally can't tell you, I can tell you some other really cool things that happened, but I couldn't swear to you that it was the next year. I got you. Well, you know, I, uh, I used to go to the Indy 500 every single year mm-hmm. and, and, uh, Costa knows what that's like in Indianapolis. That's oh, a yeah. big event. Been there. I, I've and been there. I swear it's one big long race to me. I can't remember specifically, Year to year, things that happened. Uh, yeah, so I totally understand what you're saying. But she does have a great, a great representative story that may have happened that year, and if it didn't, it was one or two of the following years that I think goes to the heart of the matter of what you're asking. What you right. want to know is this husband and wife team. The wife was kind of a not skeptical, but not as interested, and suddenly something happens to get her interested. So what happens next when they actually go together? Exactly. And, and exactly. See, okay, she well, has an answer for I, that. Okay. Well, I have two. And one of them, this one, I'm very sure happened the next year because I remember I was shocked. I was looking up in the sky and again, we had been taught, you know, how to identify regular terrestrial craft. And this was clearly not a terrestrial craft. And I, somebody had lent me um, a pair of binoculars. And so I'm looking up in the sky And I saw a craft going way too fast to be terrestrial, number one. And number two, and this is the part where if I hadn't had the the binoculars, I wouldn't have been able to see this. I watched it make a hard left turn into outer space. And I mean, like, slightly more than a 90-degree turn. Or like, like it was sharper than 90 degrees. Terrestrial craft don't do that. And... Did it have a shape? 
No, I couldn't really see that. I was like watching this light in the sky and I watched it again, turn more than 90 degrees, like on a dime, like zip, zip. it just, it, it was going, yeah. Zipping in one direction. All of a sudden it, it like zipped, you know, like a little more than 90 degrees back and disappeared. I had something similar, something, something very similar. I was, uh, uh, this isn't about me. It's about you guys. But just to let you know how I felt at the moment when I saw something like that, this thing stopped on a dime just for, I mean, it, it stopped long enough for me to go, wow, it was going really fast. And, it, and then it just went psh, straight up. And this was, this was uh, yep. a blue yep. sky. This wasn't at night. This was during the day and it just went straight up. And until it was gone into the atmosphere. And I thought, I, I didn't know what it was before then until it did that turn, like like you, Hollis. Yeah. And, and it made the turn. I was like, now, wait, wait, whoa. What was that? That doesn't make sense. And is that what you were? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, it's like by that time, I was kind of expecting like, oh, it's like, oh, I know what that is. It's just not terrestrial. Right. Right. But it was in a way life-changing because you know things show up in your bedroom and yeah that's shocking in its own way but it, it it you know implies a kind of teleportation it's not the same thing as implying some kind of craft right. you know or or else it implies you know sending a hologram like i don't really know um but it's a completely other kind of technology and so that was my introduction to that kind of technology and then um, we have a third one. And again, this one, I really don't know what year it was, but it was the coolest thing. Um, so there were probably 45 of us sitting out in a circle um, in a clearing on Mount Shasta, big clearing, big space. And the thing is, it was not just completely overcast. And I mean, solid cloud ceiling. It was drizzling on us. And so we all did a meditation the idea was, you know, make a connection. Um, and when we get out of the meditation and opened our eyes, we had meditated a hole in the clouds. Like up directly above us, there was a clear path to the night sky and you could see stars up there. But all around this, you know, just that one little hole. Um, and other than that, it was still this cloud ceiling. And you could see because you, we had meditated the hole in it, you could see how thick the cloud ceiling was. And it was pretty thick. Mm -hmm. And while we're sitting, you know, we're all kind of, you know, marveling at like, wow, look, we just meditated that. And by the way, um, we have done this in groups a number of times. Absolutely. Um, their human consciousness does, in fact, affect weather. And I can tell you about a story from Princeton like an actual study later if you want um but anyway so we're sitting there we're looking up at the at the sky through this hole in the clouds and i begin to notice there are these kind of wisps of clouds just kind of showing up in the hole they they don't really come from a direction just like all of a sudden there's a little wisp of a cloud and then there's another little wisp and they're just kind of agglomerating there like kind of out of nothing and i look at that and look at that and we're all looking at it, i guess and finally i say to costa hey you know very quietly so nobody else can hear us and again you're outdoors it's a big circle so it's not like somebody even two people away could hear you whisper right hey, costa i think they're making a heart and sure enough so we watch it and eventually like 120 degrees away from me um, around the circle, somebody goes, look, it's a heart. Really? And then a third person a few minutes later says, oh, I just got a telepathic mail message. We love you. Well, you know, I don't know about the person who had the telepathic message. I don't know who it was. I don't know how accurate they were or whatever. Um, but clearly there were 45 people there who saw a heart appear out of nowhere in, in a hole in the clouds if that makes any sense. Was it a heart heart? I mean, it was, was a heart. It, it was, was an heart. absolute heart shaped heart. And a huge, you, you're craning your neck, looking straight up, yeah. watching it form. And then not believing your eyes. You know, do you remember when you were, 
everyone's done this when you've been a kid and looking up at the clouds in the sky and you think you can see shapes, you can see, you know, faces or animals because your imagination is, is, uh, is alive and active. This was kind of like that in terms of we were looking up and watching a cloud forming, but it was inescapable that all of us finally saw the, the final shape there. And it's a heart shaped cloud, a huge heart shaped cloud floating above us. And as Hollis said, someone from across the circle said, uh, I just got a message from them. They said, we love you. Have, have you, you can make that, that stuff up. Uh, we all experience that. And that's life changing in a way. And you know why? Because this is in a whole nother dimension to the, to this phenomenon, Jimmy, which is suddenly for me, it became a whole lot more than just lights in the sky, more than just an intellectual experience like, okay, I believe there's civilizations, you know, how are they getting here? What, what are their sciences like and all that? This was the dimension of what I would call more spirituality. Suddenly there was a love component and it, it overwhelmed me and it moves me still to this day and, and actually drives what I'm doing with the etletstalk.com community, which is we're more than just about the lights in the sky and even the experiences on the ground. The, the extra dimension is the fact that at least the civilizations we believe we're contacting are, bele are benevolent and we hear a lot of stories. This is just one we gave you, but in my network, trust me, I hear a lot of stories about people who talk about the love component or the joy component that comes over for, over them when they make a connection. And that's one thing I want to convey to your audience, which is let's start thinking about uh, at least the visitors we're contacting in, in, our, in our network as more than just lights in the sky and intellectual curiosities, which is legitimate. But the fact that there are sentient beings there and when we're getting messages from them that are saying, we love you, then that opens up a whole nother conversation like, well, who are you? Why do you love us? How in the world can you love us? Human beings can be such pricks. Yes. Uh, pardon my French. Uh, it brings up all, all this kind of stuff for me. And believe me, my thoughts have gone down and down a lot of those paths because they keep saying we love you in a lot of different ways. And again, that opens up a whole nother conversation and you have to wonder what are they doing here? Um, and I have some answers for that within the community that, that I talk to and I encourage people to ask them the questions. Well, how can we, how can we build and a, a new earth together? If you're here, you love us and you have technologies that could really help us yes we're supposed to help ourselves and i totally believe that this cannot be all done for us but there are certain things that maybe human beings problems that we really cannot solve and maybe we could use uh, a galactic helping hand is it possible that some of these civilizations could be offering through their love technologies approaches perspectives experience that would be valuable to human beings at this point in time of transition i mean man we're on the edge of extinction we are right on the edge staring down in the abyss from any number of of directions you know um, ecological chemical whatever however what i tell people in the etletstalk.com community is we're also in a time of incredible opportunity where we can evolve and isn't it possible that there may be civilizations out there, these sentient beings who have been where we are and have managed to survive and have brought technologies and are, have been observing us and possibly wanting to help us get through our growth moment here without blowing ourselves to smithereens? Um, I truly believe there, that is the case. And that's why I urge people in our community to engage uh, with thought, through dreams, whatever, these these um, extraterrestrial beings, and ask them, how can we work together? If you really are here to help, uh, what is it I can do? And and just get that conversation going. That's what a movement is about. We're really explorers right now. And we're um, unearthing, pardon the pun, um, uh, uh, the answers to a lot of questions that we were never asking before this movement came about. And I think it's important that we ask those questions because the answers to some of them, if we are getting help or can receive help, will mean the survival of our species. It's not just going to be some um, some intellectual 
question of curiosity that gets answered. This is deep evolutionary stuff. We, we've got to figure out how we're going to survive and get along as humans and solve all the problems we have. And we do have help. It's time we engage that kind of galactic help. And I'm not the only one saying that. I know there are other people speaking about such a cooperation. I'm just trying to underscore that right well, now. What, what do you say to those that talk about uncooperation or negativity and that they are not here for good reasons as well? What, what do you say to that collective? Boy, that that unearths a, a stone with a lot of stuff underneath it. People can believe what they want. I personally believe that not every civilization that's been here ha has been honorable in, in our past. And it's really easy to focus on those that may have come and may have gone and, and done their thing in history. What I try to really concentrate on when people ask that cat question is, you know what? I don't have all the answers to that, but what I do know is that the Ooh, we lost you guys. Okay, we lost. We've Hello? yeah the the connection it got a little bit here. Can you hear us? Because uh, we can't hear you. Okay, no, Hello? I've got you back. Can you hear me you now? Hear can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, um, we lost the last couple of sentences there, uh, Costa, about how you respond to uh, uh, the people that that are out there that say that the contact is negative. They are not here. They're here to run the earth. They're here to control governments. They're here for their own agenda, and it's not good, and we need to... We need to keep our eyes open, and, and you were responding to that. I think it's a legitimate question to ask. I don't poo-poo that. And I do believe that there have been uh, races. It's a huge universe, and there have been races in the past that have not been honorable. Now, having said that, why do we keep concentrating on the fear porn, as David Wilcock would say, about any bad actors that might have been here? Uh, surely that's possible. Let's concentrate on the huge benevolent presence we have here. Uh, and I hear those stories all the time. Let's concentrate, is what I say, on the, the benevolent ET civilizations that we are contacting. And, and through our higher vibration and frequencies of love that we approach our contact and in doing our contact, like attracts like. We are going to be communicating with the, the spiritually evolved civilizations that are, are here for uh, highly honorable and noble purposes to help us get through uh, our time of challenges right now in, in any ways they can. And part of what we're doing now, or part of what they have asked us to do in the past, and here's something that's crucial and why I want people to come to etletstalk.com and join up. You can be a free member. We'll teach you how to make contact, put you on a map so others can find you get you into community where we're all talking about this and working together as a global team, as a movement. What's important that ET Intelligence has said to us is that we create as many ET contact teams as possible, as soon as possible, in as many places as possible. Because, they said, as humans do that, we give them permission, give the ETs permission to show up more openly in more places once they do that, even more humans will see them and then give even more permission for the ETs to show up in even more places. This becomes what they call uh, a virtuous circle. And please understand here, I'm not predicting. I know when disclosure or the landings on the White House lawn everybody wants will come. But I do believe and have been told that they will come a lot faster as we humans acknowledge their the benevolent presence that is there and work with it and increase our teams. So that's been my uh, guiding force with etletstalk.com, which is I want to get as many teams created out there as possible. And I'm putting a call out there to people who know marketing better than I do and social media than I do uh, because I want to grow our teams into the tens of thousands, not just um, a few thousand right now or say 7,000 people or maybe 20,000 who are doing contact. Let's get people doing CE5 contact in every country of the world. 
Let's get scores and scores of teams doing that. Let us just so overload the demand from humanity to interrelate, to to uh, contact. Let's just uh, synergize it so much that there will be so many appearances that we become the disclosure. We're not waiting for someone else to announce it. Right. By our activity, by what we do, by our faith in each other, by working together, we are the disclosure. Hello? You well, know? Uh, how, does the, how, how does the communication happen? Is uh, Hollis, is that you? Uh, and 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 how how... Well, how does it happen? But what is the language that is spoken? How do you guys understand each other? Okay, I'm not 100% sure what you asked. What I would say is um, communication happens in a myriad of ways. And it's different for each person. So, you know, for me, um, I do get clairaudient messages. Um, I do just know things, which is telepathic messages. Um, I get images in meditation. Right. Um, you know, it's it's all of the above. But, you know, each person's psychic abilities are unique to that person. And so they're going to get information how they get it. What, what, uh, when, uh, tell the audience exactly what Claire Audion is and what would be the difference between that and, and telepathy? Okay. Um, so just back up a little bit for every physical sense, there's a clear sense or clear sense. Right. Uh, the most common, you know, clairsentience for feeling, clairvoyance for seeing, clairaudience for hearing. And, you know, there is actually smell and taste, but those are rare. Um, and, and telepathy. So, um, Claire audience, you know, that the famed still small voice within Yes. that, um, you know, and different people, like I often ask people, can you point to the voice because they're not always in your head and you can also pay attention. This is a very, uh, sort of NLP neuro linguistic programming way to do it. But, um, you know, where does it come from? What does it sound like? Is it high pitch, low pitch? How fast does it talk? Does it have an accent? Does it have a particular cadence? And you can begin to identify um, different voices that you hear. Because for many people, there is more than one. And you know what your own, like when you're talking to yourself, you know what that sounds like. Right. Everybody knows what that sounds like. But most people, I won't say most people, a lot of people have at least one more going on. And people that, that, quote, talk to themselves, unquote, a lot, or, or like they, they have arguments with themselves, they're not actually arguing with themselves. They're arguing with something else a lot of the time. That's so that, that's clear audience. Telepathy, um, many telepaths, and this is my experience, and it is the experience of many people I've talked to. I won't say it's everybody's, but, you know, enough people that I feel fairly confident in this. Um Telepathy is like having a, you, you like get a download of information like this chunk. It's like somebody um, puts, you know, the Sunday New York Times on your doorstep, only it's in your head. And, and most people actually feel like, like a click or a thunk or there's like something goes, like, it's hard to explain, um, and, I, and I'm not sure that it's exactly the same for everybody, but there's this feeling of, like, clunk inside your head. And then the problem is, it's your job to open up the newspaper and read it. Right. So it's a, it's a sense of an impending clunk. Am I understanding well, you right? Well, clunk happens, but then you have to figure out what the information is. Is there, well, I guess am I asking, is there a warning that the clunk is about to happen. Not for me. Not for you. I, I don't know if there is for other people. It's not a question I've ever asked anybody, actually. Well, see, that's why you do this show right there. There you go. You know what? I, I only ask uh, because if you if you remember the movie The Shining, right? And Scatman Crothers, uh, this was in the book. It wasn't in the movie, but I, I, I don't think. Well, but, I didn't read the book or see the movie. Well, so Okay, well, Scatman Crothers, before he got his message would smell oranges, right? That would waft into the room. And he sure. knew. Rural faction, yes. Yeah, yeah, and he knew something was coming and he had to pay attention. There you go. And I always found and, that. And there are people. The, the smell thing, actually, I know a number of people that have that. Um, it's often, 
um, associated with either uh, Mary, you know, like the Christian Mary, or a dead relative. Interesting. I'm yep. watching Twitter right right now light up about the smell thing before something happens. Oh, cool. Yeah, and they're saying, yeah, I thought it was just me. <laughs> Somebody else just said, no, me, 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 me. So I find that interesting. <laughs> you mean you're not the only one that smells? Well, no, wait, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, you know, I um, I, I want, right, I want, I want to have the gift. I want, you know, but for me, it, it it's never really happened to me that way except for frigging deja vu. Deja vu, I can't escape. It happens to me every single day. I enjoy it when it happens, and I stop what I'm doing, and I write it out, and 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 I trip. And I love it when it happens. And I don't know if that's a gift or, it, or if it happens to everybody, but I certainly don't, uh, I don't choose to ignore it. You know what I mean? I'd rather yeah. st- stop in the moment and go, wow, here we go. All right, this is pretty cool. All right. <laughs> You know, I know what he's going to say next. <laughs> you know, so if it, that happens to you every day, that is your gift. And it is, it, in a way, it's a gift of precognition. Only you don't know it until you get there. Right, right. You know, I mean, I've had it happen to me. I've definitely had a few, um, you know, more than a few, but it's not like it happens every day. Really? Well, see, like yeah. I said, I don't know what goes on with other people, but I know. I mean, it happens so often and and it's 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 been like this my entire life for as far back as I've had a memory. I've always deja vu. I've deja vu with my family, with my teachers, with people, with this and the car, television, TV, whatever. It it just happens all the time. And and I I just thought it was normal. I still kind of do. I I and and oh, what I wanted to uh, say on that point. When you guys are doing a CE5 session, you guys are out and you're doing your thing. If, if somebody is there that is, you know, a negative mini, right, and, and it's just poo-pooing on the entire – does that have a negative effect on what you guys are out there doing? Yes. Yes, it does. Um, the, the coherence of the frequency of love and cooperation, which are, are critical – to the CE5 experience is um, is diminished. It, it is absolutely true, and we've we've seen examples of that on the retreats we've been in, uh, where even if you're careful with filtering the people that come, sometimes they still slip through, and you don't discover till later that they've got some nasty attitudes, um, skeptical attitudes, and you know, in their own right, that's okay. We're not trying to convince every last person in the world to believe what we believe or do it the way. But don't come to our party if we, you know, go find another one of other equally negative individuals and go hang out there is what I would say. But, <laughs> you know, we're trying to do something that's positive, uplifting with uh, love vibrations. You know, I'm sounding so new agey here, but uh, and I'm getting my new age on. But but it really is about it's about the love. And that's what I was talking about, that other component, these civilizations that we're trying to connect uh can tell us, it can tell about us through our frequency, who we are. You know, physicists are saying the the whole of creation is nothing but vibration and frequency. We are frequent based frequency based beings, right? So when a group gets together to do a CE five, you want them all to be like in a coherence. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that they have to agree politically with each other or have the same personalities. But when they come together centered in their heart, um, in their higher self, and they connect with each other in imagination and offer up their invitation literally to the stars, to these civilizations, these civilizations will, civilizations will detect that. And I think it brings them joy to be able to find human beings who, you know, won't shoot at them or. Right, right, or, right. No doubt. Whatever. Okay. Um, hey, hey, hold on, Hollis. We're up against our hard break. and. Yeah. I'm going to ask you guys to stay on with this. Let's do it a little over time. And uh, so, Hollis, I'll let you finish that thought when we come back. And then I'm going to throw out some actual uh, – I'm going to throw out some hard questions here. I want to talk about religion a little bit. And I want to talk about the White House and and tying that into CE5. So, Hollis, remember that thought? I'm sure. Host, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Costas McCra- Costa McCrayas and Hollis Polk. I'll be back right after this.
It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hi folks, Ray Sobs here with KGRA to tell you about something very special taking place in February 2016. I'm talking about the Space and Alien Snowfest Ufology Conference taking place at the beautiful ski and snowboard resort city of Big Bear Lake in sunny Southern California. We've got Richard Dolan, Chase Kletsky, Micah Hanks, Jason Martell, Jimmy Church, Linda Moulton Howe, Mike Barra, and keynote speaker Stanton Friedman will be presented a Lifetime Achievement Award. George Norrie and his producer Tom Danheiser from Coast to Coast AM Live will be with us all weekend. After the hectic holidays, gift yourself a retreat on top of the world. The first weekend in February 2016 with a -a one-of-a-kind ufology event featuring some of the top minds in the field. Take advantage and book your lodging early and get your tickets now. And register at Aliensnowfest.com. I'll be there. Don't miss out. All right, you fader not. Studio Dome has done it once again. A new Studio Dome fader not special. Introducing the Studio Dome Boom Box Bluetooth speaker. It's got a rear firing base film subwoofer and dual 52 millimeter main speakers. You'll never listen to your tablet or cell phone speakers again. Just click on the Studio Dome banner, use the promo code Jimmy, and you'll get the SBB for 49 bucks and free shipping. And get a Buddy 4-port USB charger for free. That's a $19.99 value right there. And they'll throw in a Buddy in the box. It's the best deal on the net anywhere. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, enter the promo code Jimmy. Go Beckley Teppy. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back to Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Costa Macreas, Hollis Polk. Fascinating conversation tonight. Part of our Thanksgiving week here. Tomorrow night, John Anthony West is going to be with us. And then Wednesday, Linda Moulton Howe. Okay, Hollis, I cut you off right before the break. What was that thought? Well, I want to say, Costa was talking about how uh, somebody with a regular with a really negative attitude would disturb group coherence and, and affect our contact. And I agree with that. Um, and I want to say there's a difference between um, I'm curious or, or slightly skeptical versus I'm actively hostile because we actually had an experience a few months ago where a new person showed up in our group um, and we had, he was brought by somebody else who was part of the group and we had been assured, you know, this guy was cool. And we set up all our chairs out in the field and, you know, we go into a meditation and after the meditation, the guy goes, by the way, I'm, I'm skeptical. I, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't really believe this is going to happen. And, you know, and I could like, I could imagine, I'm not saying I actually felt it, but I could kind of hear everybody else in their minds going, Oh God, right. no. And <laughs> so I said, but you're open, right? And the guy went, yeah, I'm open to an experience. You know, I'm open to whatever will happen. And we had really amazing contact that night. And by the end of the night, the guy was like jumping up and down with wild excitement every time something happened. I I, I thought you were going to say, then he was abducted and probed. (laughs) (laughs) Made a believer out of him. Stop projecting. Stop projecting. (laughs) No. Now, um, uh, what about the religion? I want to get into the religious aspect of this because, 
you know, throughout millennia, uh, all gods came from the stars and, and all knowledge came from the stars. And and I, I firmly believe that something has been and and was always going on. Uh, but with your contact, it, it, has it changed uh, religious views? And, and has E.T. ever mentioned anything about that? I have, um, in one communication I had, um, I'm getting an echo here. I, I hope that's not happening. No, it's not. It's not. Okay. Um, I'll tell you two stories, which which form my uh, what I wrap my mind around now concerning ET and all that. I mean, there's. Let me just say that there's a lot we can say about religion, about ancient astronauts and, and ancient aliens and all that. And there's not enough time to go into all of that. Uh, although there's there's a deep conversation we could have. However, you asked about me and how this uh, has affected me and my views. Uh, I was driving, anecdote, um, I was driving on a highway uh, here in, in uh, California in the fast lane, doing my usual 80 miles an hour and being aware of, you know, where the police might be so that I don't, I don't get a ticket. On my right-hand lane, uh, uh, a semi-truck passed me, no big deal, whipped by. I'm just uh, kind of zoning and driving and notice that it goes by. It's followed by a second truck, which doesn't go by as quickly, but it, it does uh, pull ahead of me, again, in the right lane to where I can see the rear of the truck. And I swear to you, I'm not making this up. And, 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 and you know, you might say this this was done by somebody, but it just seemed like, way too much synchronicity because I had been thinking as I was in my zoning thing about the next ET contact uh, event that we were going to have. So, you know, my mind was just running around that while, I, while I'm driving. You know how you get hypnotized on the highway. So as this second truck goes by and it's moving ahead of me, I look at the back of it and in the same way that maybe you've seen cars where someone has taken their finger and written, wash me, you know, in the dirt <laughs> of, mm-hmm. of, of the windshield of the car, you know, ha ha. Sure. But in the same way on this truck, what must have been road dirt in big block letters that I could see clearly from where I was. And yes, I was wearing glasses, but big block letters. It said on the back of the semi in the middle of the highway, apropos of nothing, it said, ETs are family. Shut up. When was the last time you saw that on a freaking semi truck? As in never. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. You sure you can say someone did that as a joke and the driver didn't know it and they're having a good laugh over a beer with their friends. But anyway, in that moment, as I'm thinking about ET, that happens to me. That's a great synchronicity. ETs are family. At another time when I was fortunate enough to be having a telepathic uh, connection with um, an ET intelligence, uh, it was said to me, do not think of us as gods now. That's not how we're coming. Think of us as elder brothers, sisters, and cousins. We're family. And that made comfortable sense to me, and that's where I'm, I've landed now. Um, you can talk all about religion, this and that and the other thing, but they may have seated us in the past. I firmly believe that that is possible. And maybe they're literally talking about, yeah, you've, you've gotten our genetics, you know, maybe more than one race. We are family and we're here to work together with you, not to be looked at as gods. You, you know, maybe we, maybe that was done earlier on in our history and there was a reason for that, but Right now, what we're called upon to do, I believe, in my spiritual viewpoint, is uh, we're partners. We're co-creating with them. Uh, we're getting, trying to find out how to get along as humans with each other. And at the same time, we're inviting this uh, more evolved spiritual intelligence, which tells us it's family, to please come work with us and help us in the areas that we're not good at so that uh, uh, we have a mutually beneficial golden age. And that's my preaching. That's me on my pulpit there for whatever religion I have around this right now. And it's a very common sense thing to me. Okay, they're family. Uh, Someone who knows a little bit more than I do. I've never had an older brother in my life, but I would like to think of E.T. as uh, probably smarter, uh, has some perspectives I don't have, 
but who still needs people like me and you to do the work that we do down here. Right. They're not going to do it for us, how but about, they will help if we ask. And Hollis, how, is your view different? Uh, is is E.T. religious or is E.T. the Jesus that we saw 2,000 years ago? None of the above. I mean, I agree with Costa. And I mean, you know, I was I was actually brought up to be an atheist. Uh, I'm not that. I am a mystic. So I am spiritual. I have my own connection to, you know, all that is, whatever. Um, so does, so do our older brothers and sisters. You know, reality is not what we have been led to believe, partly by our senses and partly by the power structures. You know, to me, religion is really about control. You know, any belief system is mind control. Always has been. Yeah. yeah. So to me, this is not in any way about religion. Um, you know, it, it, it might be related to spirituality, but maybe only in the sense that, you know, we're all part of all that is. We're all connected. You know, Chris Rock, I thought, said it best in one of his HBO specials. He said, he goes, look, let me tell you. Religion is here to make sure that we're safe and procreate and we obey and and we have order. He goes, he, he said thousands of years ago, you know, they started to find that pork was killing the tribe, right? Yep. Bad pork. And the, the, the leaders got together and were like, man, we got to save ourselves here. We got to figure this out. We know the pork is killing everybody, but everybody's hungry. And uh, oh, I got it. Let's tell them God says, <laughs> 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 right? And yep. so they go in front of everybody and they go, "Look, uh, God says we can't eat pork," and and they saved everybody. And it was now look, it's kind of a weird way, but if you think about it, it makes sense, and it's okay. I'm not poo pooing on anybody's religion, but if you think about it. There was just certain things that were used to allow people to continue to procreate, to be successful, to live another day. Mm -hmm. And and I, th I always thought that that was an interesting, an interesting take. And it's another way of instituting control. And once they found out that worked, well, then you could turn around <laughs> and use that all the time. You know, so... Right. Now, um, uh, Hollis, how I, I don't know if it's you or Costa that has more of a role in this, but who is the teacher when it comes to ET? Let's talk. And how do you how do you show people how to do this? I'll let Hollis answer that because uh, she literally does teach classes and will be teaching at retreats that we're going to have uh, specifically. Uh, how to develop. So take it away. Okay. So here's the thing. I'm not teaching people how to make exterior contact. Certainly there are plenty of people who, you know, can do a meditation and, you know, whatever. And what do you mean? Hold on, hold on. What do you mean by exterior? You know, lights in the sky. Okay. Okay. And, you know, much of the contact happens through your clear senses, right? clairvoyance of one kind or another, clairaudience, telepathy, the clairolfaction, uh, maybe even clairgustation. Things happen that way. And so I teach people how to recognize what systems they use to get their own information and how to get more accurate at it. Because here's the thing, everybody's um, clair senses, everybody's psychic abilities are unique to that person. Right. They can be grouped into different categories. But, you know, my clairvoyance is going to be a little different than the next person's clairvoyance. You know, so I know for me that when I get my information, it's in a particular place. Um, it's color. It's flat. It moves. It can move. It doesn't have to, but it can move. I get, you know, I get pictures. They're in a particular. But for other people, it, it's not that mm. they can be black and white. They can be still photos. They they're looking in a different place than I am. Other people get stuff in their bodies, you know, and, and there's a different way to interpret that. Um, if you, you know, the easiest thing in a way is if you're hearing words, right? Because if somebody's talking to you in English, presumably, or whatever language you already know, well, that's pretty clear. Right. But the other stuff, it's all like knowing, 
you know, how do I get my information? How do I get it accurately? How did you, uh, Hollis, how did you master these abilities and is, and your ability to go through that transformation and to master, is that, does that make teaching uh, easier and, 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 and to express what to look for? Okay, so I did take classes myself uh, many, many, many years ago Right. Um, for three years. Um, it was, you know, kind of a weekly class. And then every Saturday afternoon, we would go and do readings. And, you know, you'd get feedback on the readings. And that's how you find out, like, really, the short answer for anybody who wants to develop is whatever you get, check it out, right? It's all about practice. You know, Malcolm Gladwell had the thing about the 10,000 hours makes you a master. Yep. Well, this is one of those things. I've just done this more than pretty much, I don't say anybody else, but more than the average person. I've done my 10,000 hours. Do you think, and what about uh, regression? And I know that uh, you're trained in that too as well. Do you talk to contactees and and do regression therapy specifically on ET contact? You know, I never have. Um, regression for me, so I very rarely regress people. Um, and the only times I do it are sometimes people, um, you know, they'll come to me with an issue. And this really has nothing to do with ET contact at all. But they'll come to me with an issue like fear of heights or whatever. Right. And, you know, I, you know, 85 or 90 percent of people's issues come from things that happen in this lifetime. But every now and then, you know, you get like the person just cannot find any reason for again, fear of heights, fear of spiders, whatever in this lifetime. But if you sit them, you know, if you get them into a nice trance state, right, a nice meditative state, because they are the same lowered brainwave state, um, and ask them to, you know, kind of find where it is that this came from, you know, they'll pop up in another lifetime. Excuse me? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I got to tell you, the times that you end up in another lifetime with somebody, and then I do, you know, standard NLP processes with people, like you work with people as if it was this lifetime, it just happens to be another lifetime. Those things are pretty much miraculous, because there's no way to get to something. If it happened another lifetime, you have to go back to that lifetime to fix it. Right. Yeah. And, and, and is this usually, I'm imagining this, is this a first time experience for these people? They've never gone there before? Yeah, usually. It must be pretty astounding. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> and it's really fun. Well, it's really fun when, you know, they, they write to you back and go, wow, you know, I got up on my roof the first for the first time and cleaned my gutters and, like, no issue. Right, right. And, 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 and Costa, have you taken advantage of this service that is available to you? <laughs> There have been times uh, when, actually many times when I go to Hollis for advice along these lines. She has helped me, yeah, you're right, with with um, some personal stuff. And sometimes I'm pretty thick in other, in other ways and I'm not so easily reachable. And so I have to use other, other modalities. But she's always there to help, has helped. And I've watched her... Uh, since the time I've known her, and actually she was doing this long before that, I think it's like at least three decades now uh, as a, a professional clairvoyant, counselor, life coach, NLP practitioner, master hypnotherapist, etc. She's literally talked to thousands of people, and I, I, I doubt if there's any story that can surprise her because she, she's probably heard it all and has helped a lot of people. So, so of course I turn to her, uh, you know, as anybody would, you know, when you have a trusted partner, but also when you have a, a really talented one who's got all this deep experience, I mean, I'd be, I'd be an idiot not to, not to turn there for help uh, sure. or for advice. Yeah, she's, right. she's, she's talked uh, even on a practical level, no, never mind any of the, the special tools she has, just having talked through life situations with that many people, she's, like I said, heard everything and had to look at problems from so many perspectives that in a very practical way, I can always go to her for advice and say, well, look, this is what's happening in this situation. So-and-so said this and that. What do I do? How do I think? She'll have some advice just because she's got this deep experience 
uh, dealing with so many other people. And I literally mean thousands. I can't so, believe it's been cool. I'm, I'm, I, I consider myself pretty lucky that way. Yeah, you are. You are. And I can't believe we're out of time because I've got a hundred other questions. I, I, and so l- let me get some stuff out of the way really quick, Hollis, if you don't mind. Sure. Do you have the ability to walk into somebody's house and tell that there's bad stuff going on? You know, actually, I do, and I have a great story about that, but I won't tell it. Uh, um, okay, yes. fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, well, okay, and with 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 ghosts uh, or something entities that people are seeing in their house, is that a ghost? Is it an interdimensional being? Are there differences between the two? Does the devil come into play, and <laughs> and or? or relatives or survivors from the civil war. You know, I mean, it, it, what what are we talking about here when when that kind of activity is going on in somebody's house and what would you tell them right now if you had that opportunity? Well, I can't tell them what it is without being there because it can be different. You know, it can be um echoes of just something that happened in the house whether it's the, you know, this lifetime, I mean, whether it's from these occupants or occupants before that, or I suppose from the land underneath, um, it can be all kinds of things. I mean, the devil seems to me like pushing it, but any of the other things all seem very reasonable. And what, uh, when I, I always ask this and I get different answers uh, from guests, but should I ghost hunt <laughs> my <laughs> own house? Or do I just, if I don't know what I'm doing, is it best just to leave that alone and not find out something? Well, look, if you're comfortable in your own house, then great, leave it alone. If you're not comfortable, then um, if it were me, I would ask to be drawn to something to heal whatever it is that's wrong. I mean, you can you can clean out space without knowing without knowing what's there. Like you don't have to know to clean it out. And uh, one last question really quick uh, on the, on the same thing. If somebody is having, uh, you know, some minor poltergeist activity, you know, something, you know, just weird all the time, you know, because uh, we've all had the grandparents that will tell you, well, you know, that's just our ghost. You know, <laughs> that's just our ghost. It's no big deal. But if you're having something like that go on, what what do you do? Do you contact somebody or or do you ignore it or do you buy a Ouija board and try to chase them out? What do you do? Well, it depends. Again, if it doesn't bother you, leave it alone. Um, if it, if something bothers you, I mean, I've developed, a, you know, my guides showed me a method for cleaning out space. And so, what, what, I, so they, I do that. So should somebody contact you directly? Sure. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Fantastic show tonight, guys. Now, uh, before I let you go, and I, I wish we had another two hours, and I got to get you both back on because we left way too much stuff on the table. I know that ET Let's Talk is is looking for some volunteers, and you guys need some help. Um, in certain areas, uh, what exactly are you guys looking for? And, and what, you know, what, if, you know, right now it's, it's an open invitation. So where are the needs for ET? Let's talk right now. Uh, social media, for one thing, we, uh, to get all those thousands more of, uh, ET contact teams, people have to hear about us. Uh, I know from experience that there's a lot of interest in making ET contact because I hear from people every day. I know that the millennials are really open to this, for example. So if there are people out there that want to hit up social media and help us to do more outreach in more places, uh, because we have limited resources, just two people working part-time, then we would welcome that kind of intelligent help in social media. And along with that goes some uh, some marketing help. Uh, I guess maybe it's all rolled up into one. Uh, yeah, we just want to get out there more because I know that as soon as people continue to find out about etletstalk.com and the community and the movement we have, they want to jump in and join and have a lot of fun. So that kind of help is welcome. And, and Hollis, and what uh, what is on your website? And is it 888-4-hollis.com? It absolutely is. That's my website. There's all kinds of information 
um, you know, my history and background, services that I offer, a great list of books that I recommend. Um, and there are, I, I'm a big reader, so there are a lot of them. Um, blo it's a link to my blog, all kinds of stuff. And you didn't tell us the Princeton story. So I will say this. Another time. <laughs> Another time. Thank you both so much. I had a great time. Again, everybody, the links for uh, Hollis's website are there at jimmychurchradio.com. Of course, ET Let's Talk is right there, too. Click on either of their names. It'll take you straight over there. ET Let's Talk. It's go. It's free. Join. Be a part of the community and help spread the word. Hollis's website is right there, too, as well. Thank you both. I just had a wonderful night, and I feel like we could just keep on going, unfortunately. So, so do we. So do we, and we'll be happy to come back anytime. anytime. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you so much. You guys have a great, safe rest of your evening. Hollis, to you, Jimmy. Go, Thanks again. go read his mind and tell me tomorrow what's going on. Okay. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> Take that's, care. that's for the next show. Yeah, okay. You got it. Thank you, guys. Absolutely fascinating conversation. Thank you, Hollis. Thank you, Costa. Costa actually got to come in and hang out tonight uh, without Daniel. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And we are out of time. And I wanted to get back to um, – uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. It, <coughs> it, uh, it is – Oh, I'm trying to find. Oh, no, no, I'm running out of time. It is. Ah, ah. It is. Italian archaeologists have unearthed the remains of a medieval teenage girl who was burnt and thrown carelessly into a pit covered with heavy stone slabs. Apparently. She was a witch. Her burial shows that she was seen as danger even when dead. And this is according to the archaeologist. The skeleton was discovered at the complex of San Calachero in Albenja on the on uh, the Riviera, by led by a team of scientific director Philippe Pergola, professor of topology of the Orbis Christianus Antiquus at the Pontifical Institute of Archaeology at the Vatican. And it just reminds me, and I've, 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 I was looking at the pictures, it reminded me, I hate to go Hollywood, but it reminded me a little bit of The Omen, how those graves were set and there were just things and heavy stone and you weren't supposed to go back and check it out again at a later date. It was left to be untouched. It's amazing. You need to go check it out. Everything is over on our Facebook page, Jimmy Church Radio. With that, another episode of Fade to Black is coming to a close. The sun is setting here at the Game Changer Network. I'd like to thank Costa McCreas and Hollis Polk. Absolutely fascinating conversation tonight. Cannot wait to get you two back on the show. Fade to Black's executive producers, Rita Kamarian. Shows produced by Hilton J. Palm, Mark T. Kovar, LJ3, Renee, Mark Dunbar, Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is the one and only Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication. K-G-R-A, The Planet. Tomorrow night, right here, John Anthony West. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2015 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio. Everybody be safe. Go Backley Tappy. Tappy.